Dedication from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. To Douglas Hyde, L. L. D. D. Litt, President of the Gaelic League, because alumni of one Irish college and sons of fathers of the selfsame church striving to swell the sum of irish knowledge dear crivian even we unite our search and each of us as irish bardic brother in songs of connaught and the gale hath found this poem book is yours for to no other by such a kindly friendship am i bound a p g end of introduction this recording is in the public domain. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Introduction from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Of anthologies of Irish verse, there have been many. Miss Charlotte Brooks's Irish Poetry, a volume of translation of her own from the Irish led the way in the year 1789 and was followed by Hardiman's Irish Minstrelsy in 1831 with metrical translation by Thomas Furlong, Henry Grattan Curran and John de Alton. Both these volumes contained the Irish originals as well as the translations from them and both volumes were extremely valuable for their preservation of those originals but suffered from the over ornate and indeed often extremely artificial English verse into which they were translated. Highly finished that verse undoubtedly was here and there as fine as much of a Macpherson's Ossian but it was as a rule as untrue a presentment in english verse of irish gaelic poetry as pope's version of the iliad and dryden's translation of the aeneid are untrue expressions of the spirit and form of the greek and latin originals as a matter of fact these translators from the irish had not learnt the lesson not long afterwards learnt by edward walsh and sir samuel ferguson that the use of that poetical herberno english speech recently made popular by douglas hyde singe lady gregory and others was a far truer vehicle for the expression in translation or adaptation of irish gaelic poetry walsh indeed published his own translation of reliques of ancient jacobite poetry eighteen forty four and his more characteristic irish popular songs eighteen forty seven it might almost be thought as a protest against the artificial character of previous collections of the kind not excepting montgomery's anthology which preceded his second volume by a year dr drummond's is ancient irish minstrelsy translated by himself which appeared in eighteen fifty two is an attempt to hark back to the eighteenth century and early nineteenth century formal school of poetry but has fine passages such as his cuckooin's chariot expanded from a passage in the breach in the plain at Nyrthenay this wise tendency to treat irish poetry in an irish way through the medium of what i have already called hiberno english speech was lost sight of by the young islanders whose work was as a rule oratorical rather than poetical when verse became the medium or in very large part the medium of their political propaganda thomas davis and his friends felt more under the influence of scott and macaulay than under that of the gaelic poets immediately preceding them or contemporary with them 
no doubt they took a pleasure in printing irish words in irish characters here and there in some of their national lyrics and now and again we find in davis more particularly the irish human touch which when he had time to write poetry rather than verse so distinguishes him but as a rule the slurring appeals to patriotism on the part of the young island poets is little better than versified oratory thomas moore was more individual as a poet than any of the young island group yet whilst he undoubtedly possessed the irish characteristics of wit and fancy sentiment and satire he had nothing of the spirit of the irish countryside in his composition irish was not spoken by his parents or neighbours in dublin and when years afterwards he was seeking materials for his history of ireland in the library of trinity college dublin he was amazed to find what a great body of gaelic literature in prose and verse actually new to him lay collected there before his eyes the classics inspired the anacreontics of thomas little his poetical tales coloured though they were by his celtic imagination as well as by his west indian recollections were entirely derived from eastern never from irish sources the only purely irish influence upon his work was that of irish music and that influence has made his irish melodies in part at any rate imperishable in spite of his fine as well as faithful translations from the irish the influence of byron upon callanan is obvious and gerald griffin though much nearer to the spirit of his native soil as a poet than most of his contemporaries was drawn like so many young irishmen of letters under london literary influences it was never more than half emancipated from them mangan on the other hand had the good fortune to be able to study in translation some of the finer specimens of gaelic verse and his essentially mystic genius and a fine musical ear drew from that old irish poetry as something which is lacking in the writings of his contemporaries ferguson and edward walsh alone excepted yet mangan like moore went to the east was some of his inspiration though unlike moore he drew more of it from contemporary gurian poetry which he translated adapted and imitated with characteristic power but mangan at the end of his career did a hasty piece of work of a thoroughly irish kind in his translations of the gaelic poets and poetry of munster from john o'daly the gaelic publisher and bookseller few of which as mr d j o'donoghue his biographer rightly says are of high poetical merit but it is only fair to add in mr o'donoghue's words that mangan who did not live to see them published would have given them had he survived their appearance as he often did with his earlier poems an additional polish or other necessary revision the vulgar verse which exploited the stage irishman before his time was transformed by samuel lover into a new medium for the expression of humorous character sketches of irish life these lyrics written to irish popular airs or original compositions by the author had a great vogue in their day and on the strength of the reputation achieved by them lover published an anglo-irish anthology of irish poetry lyrics of ireland in eighteen fifty eight much pains has been bestowed on the collection and classification of the poems in this illustrated anthology its anglo-irish character is evident from the small proportion of either translations or adaptations from the irish that it contains but one poem in ten and sentimental poems are too predominant in the volume much of it moreover is mere convivial and comic historical and political verse but it is nevertheless the most comprehensive as well as typical collection of irish verse that has yet appeared and as it claims to be the most national in the widest sense of the word crofton croker's popular songs of ireland is a collection of anglo-irish folk songs and ballads gleaned from an unfortunately narrow field which though much still remains to be done to supplement it more especially in the north of ireland dr joyce has in his folk song volume of nineteen o six added a considerable number of irish popular ballads in the english tongue 
to Croker's anthology. Meantime, other anthologies of Irish poetry were seeing the light. Charles Gavin Duffy's Afterwards, Sir Charles Gavin Duffy's well-known volume of the Ballad Poetry of Ireland, which had reached a 40th edition in 1869. Hayes's two volumes of the Ballads of Ireland, 1855, and a very comprehensive but far from choice collection and the harp of erin a small but interesting anthology edited by ralph verian and published in eighteen sixty nine in which northern writers are more adequately represented than elsewhere to this may be added the spirit of the nation a collection of the best of the poems published in that famous political journal edited by gavan duffy and michael joseph barris's collection the songs of ireland eighteen forty five to which thomas davis wrote a stirring introduction dennis florence mccarthy's the book of irish ballads eighteen forty six and hercules ellis's songs of ireland and romances and ballads of ireland eighteen forty nine and eighteen fifty and william johnston's boyne book of poetry and song an orange collection eighteen fifty nine with the exception of a volume of my own in the mayfair library and its title songs of irish wit and humour shows of limited scope no anthology of irish poetry appeared for many years until the interesting american collection of alfred m williams the circumstances under which that anthology was compiled were remarkable mr williams a reporter of the new york tribune during fenian days was imprisoned in dublin under the arms act for carrying a weapon which as an american citizen he has always been in the habit of doing he solaced his enforced leisure by the study of irish poetry and eventually published with messrs osgood and co of boston his scholarly and discriminating volume the poets and poetry of ireland this anthology had the advantage of longfellow's criticism as it was going through the press and is distinguished by the interesting essays which preface most of its sections and the critical and biographical notes which deal with the more important irish poets like lovers collection it is divided into sections relating to the various types of irish poetry but more stress is laid by williams upon translations from the irish and generally speaking it may be said to be more expressive gaelic than anglo-irish genius it was followed by mr t d sullivan's emerald gems eighteen eighty five the emerald wreath and three american irish collections the ballad poetry of ireland in ford's national library eighteen eighty six connolly's household library of ireland's poets eighteen eighty seven and the new universal song book p t kennedy eighteen eighty seven meantime there have been a fresh flowering of irish poetry brought about by what has been called the irish literary renaissance whose first inspirers were sir samuel ferguson mangan edward walsh and aubrey de vere but to the influence of standish o'grady through his heroic history of ireland the main impulse to this movement was undoubtedly given mr yeats might have been drawn away to lead a school of english mystic poets but for that influence and dr todd hunter and other writers were probably also have been contented to cast in their lot with the english poets amongst whom they lived mr o'grady himself an irish scholar though perhaps more greek than irish in expression fired the imagination of his friends and drew them to the contemplation of irish heroic themes for which he had shown so fine a feeling catherine tynan who had fallen under the spell of rossetti may be claimed as a disciple of his as may mr t w rolleston but undoubtedly mr yeats was his greatest convert and the founder and his influence of the neo-celtic school of irish poetry and in conjunction with lady gregory of the irish literary theatre on its heroic side it is remarkable how his faithfulness to technique has impressed itself upon his followers 
for like his brother poet a e he is an artist to his fingertips if he has been blamed for the limited amount of his poetical output he has at any rate a complete answer that he has put artistic endeavour into each poem he has written and that he has as a propagandist spoken and written more for the creation of irish literary and graphic art and with more effect than any irishman of his time and finally that his latest poetical work shows a remarkable departure in fresh and advanced directions mr yeats is also one of our anthologists and his collection a book of irish verse shows a more catholic taste than could have been expected from one of his fastidious word-for-word -word finish halliday sparling's irish minstrelsy eighteen eighty seven had its vogue before the new school of irish symbolists had arisen under mr yeats's aegis and mr hinkson's collection of verse by members of trinity college dublin eighteen ninety four and his wife's knee catherine tynan delightful florilegium of irish love songs also anticipated that poetical period as to a large extent did the most ambitious and comprehensive volume of irish verse that had yet appeared a treasury of irish poetry in the english tongue eighteen ninety edited by dr stopford brooke and mr t w rolleston afterwards his son-in-law this anthology is more of a collection than a selection of anglo-irish poetry or rather as the editors describe it irish poetry in the english tongue for it contains not a few fine translations and adaptations from the irish it is as it promises to be a compendium of poetical literature in the making a history of irish poetry in the english tongue as shown by examples of every variety of it deserving critical recognition another important collection rather than selection of irish poetry and exhibiting great pains in its gathering is mr cook's the dublin book of irish verse which has the advantage of being a practically up-to-date anthology it is arranged in the main in chronological order and typical illustrations are given chiefly from anglo-irish writers though it also contains many good translations from the irish it has no literary formation and no biographical sketches of the poets presented or such short critical estimates of the work as are to be found in the brooks rouston collection but there are about thirty pages of useful notes referring to the sources of the poems or explanatory of the allusions in them other important anthologies and the latest in the field are mrs tynan hinkson's and mr patrick gregory's recently published volumes entitled the wild harp and modern anglo-irish verse respectively the first volume like mr yeats's contains the poems that have made a special appeal to the anthologist poems likely to capture for english ears sensitive to a wild music just such strains as might be sounded by the strings of a harp something thin strange forlorn something a little unearthly and exquisite else there would be no reason to garner it this method of selection shuts out reflective poetry unless the reflection is brief and shining it bars propagandist poetry altogether mr gregory's anthology only deals with poems whose authors were living when his selection was made he only asks that his poet should be of irish blood he is not careful that their work should be irish in atmosphere he is very catholic in his taste and introduces his readers some half a dozen writers of finely distinctive verse his work is either quite fresh or has been hitherto overlooked by anthologists john eglinton helen lanyon sir samuel kitely florence wilson though partial to the ballad and himself a master of this form of verse he lays special stress on the symbolist lyrics of what we may call the irish georgian school of writers mr thomas macdonough mr george plunkett mr darrell figgis mr j h cousins and mr sidney royce lysort the most notable new ballad in his book is miss emily lawless's the third trumpet one of the last poems she ever wrote and a very remarkable one 
while dealing with the bibliography of the subject certain british anthologies may be mentioned which have introduced irish verse to the general body of readers the first and most important of these is that beautiful volume lara celtica selected with great discrimination by mrs william sharp from the best irish scotch welsh cornish and breton poetry available in the year eighteen ninety six and prefaced by a striking introduction from the pen of her husband who as a celtic writer has adopted the norm de plume of fiona mccloyd next comes mr brimley johnson's charmingly illustrated full volumes of british ballads now to be had for one shilling in every man's library in which there is an interesting irish selection it has been followed by the oxford book of verse edited by sir quiller couch whose celtic instincts have led him to admit not a few irish poems into his volume conspicuous amongst the writers for the book of georgian poets are some writers of irish blood and much room has been found in mr walter gerald's living poets for the work of irishmen and irish women finally attention should be called to two notable anthologies drawn straight from the irish gaelic dr sigerson like miss brooke had preferred to make all the translations from the irish contained in his bard of the gael and gaul this volume appeared in eighteen ninety seven but much of the work had been done in the sixties when following in the footsteps of edward walsh dr sigerson in cooperation with the late john o'dally accomplished for munster lyrics what dr hyde has since achieved for the religious and love poetry of connaught in his two memorial books the love songs of connaught and the religious songs of connaught in his collection which is prefaced by a peculiarly interesting and as well a scholarly introduction and contains a wealth of valuable notes dr sigerson covers practically the whole ground of gaelic poetical literature not only making translations in the metres and spirit of irish verse of every kind heroic religious sententious humorous descriptive erotic hitherto undoubt with but being always ready to break a lance with former translators such as ferguson walsh and mangan by presenting fresh versions of his own of famous gaelic originals lastly we come to miss eleanor hulse's delightful volume the poem book of the gale this is written much on the same lines of dr sigerson's book but with these differences besides making some excellent translations of her own from the irish she gives her readers the best metrical translations made by the leading irish poets of this century and the last and by such brilliant prose writers as mr standish hayes o'grady professor cuno mayer and lady gregory she covers as much ground as dr sigerson though she does not go into as close detail in the matter of the origins of irish verse and its peculiar metric but she presents a very fine prose translation from her own hand of the Salter Naran, a ninth century Irish version of Paradise Lost and Regained, attributed to Dengus the Caldy, and never rendered into English before, and she prints in translation an interesting set of recently collected Irish folk poems, religious and secular, as well as translations in verse and prose from contemporary Gaelic poetry in what respects does my own anthology of irish poetry differ from those described roughly speaking it may be said to be a selection of irish poetry old and new old and modern gaelic poems in english first translation and anglo-irish poetry of the last two centuries which have most appealed to me as illustrating the leading features of gaelic hiberno english and anglo-irish verse i do not suggest that there are not other poems or even many poems equal in merit to those chosen for this volume but i have been careful to make such a selection under the seven heads which appear to me most illustrative of the special characteristics of irish poetry as i hope will be found to yield as much variety of thought style and metrical expressions as could well be contained within the compass 
of from three to four hundred pages my headings are nature poetry wonder poetry love poetry war poetry national poetry countryside poetry spiritual and philosophical poetry and religious poetry i have been led to adopt this order of subjects for good reasons the earliest irish poetry consists of mystical nature hymns and nature enters largely into the poems of the Kirkulane and fenian sagas while nature poems pure and simple are attributed to finn macumhale himself but interblend with the visible beauties of this world are the invisible enchantians and supernatural appearances of the fairies the denizens of that other world which amongst the gales was neither in heaven or hell but in intermediate space love poetry finds early expression amongst the gales much earlier expression from both sexes than is to be found in any other european literature the irish were without verse epics but their prose romances are interspersed with lyrics of many kinds including love lyrics of poignant beauty amongst these may be mentioned deirdre's farewell to alba her lament over the bodies of nacy arden and anley and her passionate rejection a year later of king connor's attempts to win her love the lamentation over their lovers of the two credfas fans noble farewell to cut plain and grain's sleep song over dermot when they are hiding from the pursuit of fion are love poems of the rarest quality i have placed the irish war poetry next because it follows naturally upon the love contests between chieftain and chieftain and also because it stretches from pagan to early christian times and through them in its many modes of daring triumph and defeat down to the rebellion of ninety eight flickering out finally in smithy o'brien's and the fenian rebellions but it is not until the tribal system had been broken for ever that there emerged that spirit of common irish nationality which makes irish patriotic poetry so distinctive the love for ireland is no doubt most tenderly and perfectly expressed by saint colomba but it is not until the clans had united in common defence of the whole country and until ireland began to be described by her bards by such loving names as the little dark rose or the silk of the clehi or again by such titles as Cornelie or Kathleen Lee Hulhan or the Shan Van Vocht that a spirit of nationalism had been abused sufficient to endure and bear because it hoped for all things this patriotic poetry beginning as suggested with Saint Columba carried on by Keating the historian in his delightful letter to erin and then spreading it in every direction over ireland and overseas with irish exiles it is no sense confined to poets of any particular creed or political belief it is as strong in emily lawless as in d'arcy mcgee as fervently expressed by sir samuel ferguson as stephen gwynne or standish o'grady or a e i doubt whether there is any poetical literature in the world so suffused with this genuine love of country or in which it is expressed with more delicate feeling folk songs have come to us in countless numbers from the gaelic and anglo-irish alike but the gaelic folk songs are without doubt the finest specimens of these have been given in translation with all the skill commanded by mangan ferguson walsh dr sigerson dr hyde mr p j mccall miss eleanor hull and mr thomas macijona for their collection warm obligations are due to hardiman edward walsh dr sigerson dr hyde mr mccall mr p h pierce and to the gaelic league and irish folk song society they would ill be spared speaking as they do straight from the heart of the irish people lastly we have to deal with irish religious poetry and the spiritual and philosophical poetry which has followed it in recent years and which is the most remarkable outcome of contemporary irish literary thought 
unless indeed the new irish literary drama may be said to rival it as an expression of the modern irish mind though let it be noted that three of its most prominent representatives mr w b yeats mr george russell a e and mr padraic Colum, are also leading dramatists of the irish literary theatre early irish religious poetry is remarkable not only for its fine metrical form but for its cheerful spirituality its open-air freshness and for its occasional touches of kindly humour and the later religious poetry of o'daly and kindred writers as preserved by dr hyde whilst of a more sombre character is beautifully fervid and extraordinarily finished in its technique and what may be called the wild flowers of irish religious poetry the short prayers invocations and charms are as delightful in their degree as all readers of dr hyde's religious songs of connaught must confess and now i hand over to my readers the song wreath i have been long gathering for them may they grow to love as much as i do what i have elsewhere described as the sprays of druid oak and yew and red branch rowans hall with dew and sedges sighing from the strand whence oisin rode to fairyland and festals blooms whose bardic breath pleasure to the proud elizabeth heath plumes that o'er our princes sang exultant to the battle clang pale immortelles whose plaintive lay still murmurs o'er their hero clay and wild flowers plucked with artless art from out the irish peasant's heart wood shamrocks noin eens from that lawn the drinun dun and canavorn arbutus from killarney's shore bog myrtle magical less more and every blossom else above dark rosaline's own rose of love alfred percival graves end of introduction Ode from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Canwright, Colorado Springs. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams, world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams. Yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditties, we build up the world's great cities, and out of a fabulous story, we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown, and three with a new song's measure can trample an empire down. We, in the ages lying, in the buried past of the earth, built Nineveh with our sighing, and Babel itself with our mirth, and o'er through them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worth. For each age is a dream that is dying, or one that is coming to birth. End of Ode. This recording is in the public domain. The Scribe from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. The Scribe from the Early Irish. A leafy grove surrounds me quite, For my delight the blackbirds flit, While o'er my little book's lined words Sweet warbling birds their scribe salute. The cuckoo in his mantle grey Cries on all day through lush tree tops, And verily God shield me still, Well speeds my quill beneath the copse. End of the scribe. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare In County Antrim, Northern Ireland, Situated in the north-east of the island of Ireland. The Song of M. Morgan From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Song of M. Morgan By M. Morgan, a prehistoric bard From the Books of Lecan and Ballymode I am the wind on the sea for might I am a wave of the deep for length I am the sound of the sea for fright I am a stag of seven points for strength I am a hawk on a cliff for lightness, 
I am a tear of the sun for brightness. I am a salmon in wisdom's fountain. I am a lake that afar expands. I am knowledge and poesy's mountain. I am a spear in a spoiler's hands. I am a god who fashions smoke from magic fire for a druid to slay with. Who but I will make clear each question the mind of man still goes astray with? Who but myself the assembly's knows of the house of the sages on high sleeve myth? Who but the poet knows where in the ocean the going down of the great sun is? Who seven times sought the fairy fords without or fear or injury? And who declareth the moon's past ages and the ages thereof that have yet to be? Who out of the shadowy haunts of Tethra Hitherward draweth his herds of kine, who segregated them from each other to browse the plains of the watery brine? For whom will the fish of the laughing ocean be making welcome, if not for me? Who shapeth as I can the spell of letters, a weapon to win them out of the sea? Invoke a satirist, fit incantations to weave for you, O folk of the waves, even me, the druid, Forth furnishing ogham letters on oaken staves, even me, the parter of combatants, even me, who the fairy height enter to find a cunning enchanter to lure with me your shoals to light. I am the wind of the sea for might. End of the Song of M. Morgan. This recording is in the public domain. First Winter Song From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Take my tidings, Stags contend, Snows descend, Summers end, A chill wind raging, The sun low keeping, Swift to set or seas high sweeping, dull red the fern, shapes are shadows, wild geese mourn o'er misty meadows, keen cold limes, each weaker wing, icy times, such I sing, take my tidings. End of First Winter Song this recording is in the public domain. King and Hermit From The Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Colleen McMahon King and Hermit A tenth-century poem first published and translated by Professor Kuno Mayer. Marvin, brother of King War of Connacht, in the seventh century, had renounced the life of a warrior prince for that of a hermit. The king endeavored to persuade his brother to return to his court, when the following colloquy took place between them. Guar. Now, Marvin, hermit of the grot, why sleepest thou not on quilted feathers? Why, on a pitch-pine floor, instead, still make thy bed, despite all weathers? Marvin. I have a shilling in the wood. None save my god has knowledge of it. An ash tree and a hazel nut, its two sides shut, great oak boughs roof it. Two heath clad posts beneath a buckle of honeysuckle its frame are propping. The woods around its narrow bound, swine fattening mast are richly dropping. From out my shilling, not too small, familiar all, fair paths invite me. Now, blackbird, from my gable end, sweet sable friend, thy notes delight me. With joy the stags of Oak Ridge leap into their clear and deep-banked river. Far off Red Roiny glows with joy, muckraw, moin moy, in sunshine quiver. With mighty mane a green-barked yew upholds the blue, his fortress green. An oak uprears against the storms, tremendous forms, stupendous scene. Mine apple tree is full of fruit, from crown to root a hostel's store. My bonny, nutful hazel bush leans branching lush against my door. 
A choice pure spring of cooling draught is mine. What prince has quaffed a rarer? Around it cresses keen, O king, invite the famishing wayfarer. Tame swine and wild, and goat and deer, assemble here upon its brink. Yea, even the badger's brood draw near, and without fear lie down to drink. A peaceful troop of creatures strange, they hither range from wood and height, to meet them slender foxes steal, at vesper peal, O oh my delight. These visitants, as to a court, frequent resort to seek me out. Pure water, brother Guar, are they, the salmon gray, the speckled trout. Red rowans, dusky sloes and mast, O oh, unsurpassed and God-sent dish, Blackberries, whortleberries blue, Red strawberries to my taste and wish. Sweet apples, honey of wild bees, And after them of eggs a clutch, Halls, berries of the juniper, Who, king, could cast a slur on such? A cup with meat of hazelnut Outside my hut in summer shine, Or ale with herbs from wood in spring, are worth, O king, thy costliest wine. Bright bluebells o'er my board I throw, a lovely show my feast to spangle. The rushes radiance, oaklets gray, briar tresses gay, sweet goodly tangle. When brilliant summer casts once more her cloak of color o'er the fields, sweet tasting marjoram, pig nut, leek, to all who seek her verdure yields. Her bright red breasted little men, their lovely music then outpour. The thrush exults, the cuckoos all, around her call, and call once more. The bees, earth's small musicians, hum, no longer dumb in gentle chorus. Like echoes faint of that long plaint, the fleeing wildfowl murmur o'er us. The wren, an active songster now, from off the hazel bough pipes shrill. Woodpeckers flock in multitudes, with beauteous hoods and beating bill. With fair white birds, the crane and gull, the fields are full while cuckoos cry. No mournful music, heath poults dun, through russet heather sunward fly. The heifers now, with loud delight, summer bright, salute thy reign. Comfort smooth for toilsome loss, tis now to cross the fertile plain. The warblings of the wind that sweep from branchy wood to sapphire sky, the river falls, the swan's far note, delicious music floating by. Earth's bravest band, because unhired, all day untired, makes cheer for me. In Christ's own eyes of endless youth, can this same truth be said of thee? What though in kingly pleasures now, beyond all riches thou rejoice, content am I, my Saviour good, should on this wood have set my choice. Without one hour of war or strife, through all my life at peace I fare. Where better can I keep my tryst with our Lord Christ, O brother Guar? Guar, my glorious kingship, yea, and all thy sire's estates that fall to me, my Marvin I would gladly give, so I might live my life with thee. End of King and Hermit This recording is in the public domain. St. Columba in Iona, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. St. Columba in Iona, from an Irish manuscript in the Burgundian Library, Brussels. Delightful would it be to me, from a rock pinnacle, to trace continually the ocean's face, that I might watch the heaving waves of noble force, to God the Father chant their staves of the earth's course, that I might mark its level strand, to me no lone distress, that I might hark the seabird's wondrous band, sweet source of happiness, that I might hear the clamorous billows thunder on the rude beach, that by my blessed church side I might ponder their mighty speech, or watch surf-flying gulls the dark shoal follow with joyous scream or mighty ocean monsters spout and wallow, wonder supreme. That I might well observe of ebb and flood all cycles therein, and that my mystic name might be for good, but coolry erin. That gazing toward her on my heart might fall a full contrition, that I might then bewail my evils all, though hard the addition. That I might bless the Lord who all things orders for their great good, the countless hierarchies through heaven's bright borders, land, strand, and flood. 
that I might search all books, and from their chart find my soul's calm. Now kneel before the heaven of my heart, now chant a psalm. Now meditate upon the King of Heaven, Chief of the Holy Three. Now ply my work, by no compulsion driven, What greater joy could be? Now plucking dulse upon the rocky shore, Now fishing eager on, Now furnishing food unto the famished poor, In hermitage anon. The guidance of the King of Kings Hath been vouchsafed unto me, If I keep watch beneath his wings, No evil shall undo me. End of St. Columba in Iona This recording is in the public domain. The Irish Wolfhound by Dennis Florence McCarthy From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England From the Foray of Con O'Donnell his nature, his stature tall, his body long, his back like night, his breast like snow, his foreleg pillar-like and strong, his hind leg like a bended bow, rough curling hair, head long and thin, his ear a leaf so small and round, not Bran, the favourite dog of Finn, could rival John MacDonald's hound, as fly the shadows o'er the grass he flies with step as light and sure he hunts the wolf through toston pass and starts the deer by leesonor the music of the sabbath bells o oh, con has not a sweeter sound than when along the valley swells the cry of john macdonald's hound end of the irish wolfhound this recording is in the public domain The Rock of Cashel by Sir Aubrey de Vere From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England Royal and saintly Cashel, I would gaze Upon the wreck of thy departed powers Not in the dewy light of matin hours nor the meridian pomp of summer's blaze but at the close of dim autumnal days when the sun's parting glance through slanting showers shed o'er thy rock throned battlements and towers such awful gleams as brighten o'er decay's prophetic cheek at such a time methinks there breathes from thy lone courts and voiceless isles a melancholy moral such as sings on the lone traveller's heart amid the powers of vast persepolis on her mountain stand or thebes half buried in the desert sand end of the rock of cashel this recording is in the public domain Glengarry by Sir Aubrey de Vere from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org, recording by Elaine Conway, England. Gazing from each low bulwark of this bridge, how wonderful the contrast! Dark as night, here amid cliffs and woods, with headlong might, the black stream whirls through ferns and drooping sedge neath twisted roots moss brown and a weedy ledge gushing aloft from yonder birch-clad height leaps into air a cataract snow-white falling to gulfs obscure the mountain ridge like a grey warder guardian of the scene above the cloven gorge gloomily towers o'er the dim woods a gathering tempest lowers save where athwart the moist leaves lucid green a sunbeam dancing glancing through disparted showers sparkles along the rill diamond sheen a sunburst on the bay turn and behold the restless waves resplendent in their glory 
sweep glittering past yon purpled promontory bright is apollo's breastplate bathed in gold yon bastioned islet gleams thin insists are rolled translucent through each glen a mantle hoary veils those peaked hills shapely as e'er in story delphic or alpine or vesuvian old minstrels have sung from rock and headland proud the wild wood spreads its arms around the bay the manifold mountain cones now dark now bright now seen now lost alternate from rich light to spectral shade and each dissolving cloud reveals new mountains as it floats away end of glengariff this recording is in the public domain Siberia by james clarence mangan from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england in siberia's wastes the ice wind's breath woundeth like the tooth steel lost siberia doth reveal only blight and death blight and death alone no summer sun shines night is interblent with day in siberia's wastes alway the blood blackens the heart pines in siberia's wastes no tears are shed for they freeze within the bram naught is felt but dullest pain pain acute yet dead pain as in a dream when years go by funeral paced yet fugitive when man lives and doth not live doth not live nor die in siberia's wastes are sands and rocks nothing blooms of green or soft but the snow peaks rise aloft and the gaunt ice blocks and the exile there is one with those they are part and he is part for the sands are in his heart and the killing snows therefore in those wastes none curse the czar each man's tongue is cloven by the north blast who heweth nigh with sharp scimitar and such doom each trees till hunger gnawn and cold slain he at length sinks there yet scarce more a corpse than ere his last breath was drawn end of Siberia. this recording is in the public domain a sigh for knock many by william carlton from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england take proud ambition take thy fill of pleasures won through toil or crime coal learning climb thy rugged hill and give thy name to future time philosophy be keen to see whate'er is just or false or vain take each thy meed but oh give me to range my mountain glens again pure was the breeze that fanned my cheek as o'er oh, not many's brow i went when every lonely dell could speak in airy music vision sent false world i hate thy cares and thee i hate the treacherous haunts of men give thee back my early heart to me give back to me my mountain glen how light my youthful visions shone when spanned by fancy's radiant form but now her glittering bow is gone and leaves me but the cloud and storm with wasted form and cheek all pale with heart long seared by grief and pain then roll i'll seek thy native vale i'll tread my mountain glens again thy breeze once more may fan my blood thy valleys all are lovely still and i may stand where oft i stood in lonely musings on thy hill but ah the spell is gone no art in crowded town or native plain can teach a crushed and breaking heart to pipe the song of youth again 
End of a sigh for knock many. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by Edward Dowden from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. I have wept tears and learnt, I fear, sad ways of searching for a smile, and I can guess the secret of a wan mouth's droopingness, and to know which eyes are they that waste their gaze on the hid grave of hope. Yet nearer, the less my heart leaps up to utter thanks and bless our earth which bears sweet flowers and to the glad face of these unwearied waters thanks to them for brief intense bright moments when we see our life stand clear in joy we kiss the hem of god's robe in a rapture and our whole on wind-swept hilltops by the mystery of ocean on still morns or when the soul springs to the lark in a fine ecstasy. End of sonnet. This recording is in the public domain. Four Ducks on a Pond by William Allingham From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Four ducks on a pond, A grass bank beyond, A blue sky of spring, White clouds on the wing, What a little thing To remember for years, To remember with tears. End of Four Ducks on a Pond this recording is in the public domain. Foam Flakes by Standish O'Grady From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England Gotten in the strife of waters twinkling little stars of foam restless beautiful white daughters of a father made to roam under sun and under moon under many a cloudy sky to a low monotonous tune ye go glancing dancing by fleeting shapes of rarest beauty poetry and life and joy i would err in manhood's duty if i passed you like a boy I will lie down here and weave a web of similes to you in the long rye grass and cleave a little lane to see you through shooting quivering restless flamelets on a restless heart you seem fairy tenanted white hamlets rocked of earthquakes on the stream whitest clouds of bluest ether pressed in eons hands of snow thrown in multitudes together on the streams of earth below forms as undefined as faces seen in dreamland ghosts of white flowers that grew in heavenly places fed on heavenly air and light i would cast my lot with you in your bundle would be bound shining maidens bid adieu to this barren steady ground dance with you amid the ridges and the madness of the stream sleep and kiss you where the midges on the silent water gleam end of foam flakes this recording is in the public domain from shannon to sea by e g a holmes from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England The Shannon bore me to thy bosom wide I wandered with it on its winding way By fields of yellow corn and new-mown hay 
and far blue hills that rose on either side and low dark woods that fringed the ebbing tide and ever as its waters neared the west out of the slumber of its broadening breast faint momentary ripples rose and died and rose again before the breeze and grew to wavelets dancing in the noonday light and these were changed to waves of ocean blue and creek and headland faded from the sight and oh at last at last i floated free on the long rollers of the open sea end of from shannon to sea this recording is in the public domain eternal vigil by e g a holmes from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england oh once again upon thy heaving breast i floated like a sea-bird when it braves the shoreward onset of thy flowing waves and leaps triumphant on each rushing crest round me in dark magnificent unrest the billows of the wild atlantic rolled far far away into the gates of gold the sunlit portals of the stormy west oh never wearied in the hush of noon thy billows break the paths of golden sleep they break the dream and lustre of the moon earth knows the hours of darkness thou dost keep eternal vigil still thy surge is white flash through the deepest gloom of starless night end of eternal vigil this recording is in the public domain Birds by Moira O'Neill from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org, recording by Elaine Conway, England. Sure, maybe ye've heard the storm thrush whistling bold in March before there's a primrose peeping out, or a wee red comb on the larch whistling the sun to come out o'er the clouds and the wind to come over the sea but for all he can whistle so clear and loud he's never the bird for me sure maybe you've seen the song thrush after an april rain slip from in under the dripping leaves wishful to sing again and lo we love when he's near the nest and loud from the top of the tree but for all he can flatter the heart in your breast he's never the bird for me sure maybe ye've heard the cashadu call in his mate in may when one sweet thought is the whole of his life and he tells it the one sweet way but my heart is sore at the cashadu filled with his own soft glee over and over his me and you he's never the bird for me sure maybe ye've heard the red breast singin his loan on a thorn mindin himself o oh, the dear days lost brave wid his heart forlorn the time is in dark november and no spring hopes as he remember he sings remember athon's the wee bird for me end of birds this recording is in the public domain Sheeps and Lambs by Catherine Tynan Hinkson from the Book of Irish Poetry Part One Read for Librivox dot org Recording by Elaine Conway England All in the April morning April airs were abroad Sheep with their little lambs passed me by on the road The sheep with their little lambs passed me by on the road all in the april evening i thought on the lamb of god the lambs were weary and crying with a weak human cry i thought on the lamb of god going meekly to die up in the blue blue mountains dewy pastures are sweet rest for the little bodies 
rest for the little feet rest for the lamb of god up on the hilltop green only a cross of shame two stark crosses between all in the april evening april airs were abroad i saw the sheep with their lambs and thought on the lamb of god end of sheeps and lambs this recording is in the public domain april in ireland by nora hopper from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england she hath a woven garland all of the sighing said and all her flowers of snowdrops grown on the winter's edge the golden looms of tierna and og wove all the winter through her gown of mist and raindrops shot with a cloudy blue sunlight she holds in one hand and rain she scatters after and through the rainy twilight we hear her fitful laughter she shakes down on her flowers the snows less white than they then quickens with her kisses the folded knots of may she seeks the summer lover that never shall be hers fain for gold leaves of autumn she passes by the firs though buried gold it hideth she scorns her sedgy crown and pressing blindly sunwards she treads her snowdrops down her gifts are all a fardel of wayward smiles and fears yet hope she also holdeth this daughter of the years a hope that blossoms faintly set upon sorrow's edge she hath a woven garland all of the sighing sedge end of april in ireland this recording is in the public domain Glorney's Weir by Winifred M. Letts From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England At night when the world was sleepy and still, I'd wake, maybe in the depths of the dark, And think of the river below the hill That flows so fast by the ruined old mill never a sound besides would i hear but the water rowing at glorney's weir i'd think to myself how day would come soon the water hens wake and the wagtails stir the kingfisher flash in the light of the noon from the willowy banks of knock maroon but through the day you could scarcely hear the voice of the river at glorney's weir i'd wake in the depth of the dark maybe when the friendly voices of the day were still but the river would lift its song for me down from the mountains off to the sea and glad was i in the night to hear the roar of the waters at glorney's weir end of glorney's weir this recording is in the public domain the nine green glens by john stevenson from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england sorrow and strife be far away from these sweet vales and hills for a oh who would think of sword and death that feels the living sea's sweet bread blow through the nine green glens to-day who sees the blue smoke skyward curled from many a lowly glen hearthstone each with a pleasure and a pain a pathos and romance its own each little household a world who that can hear the voice of morn the whisper of the springing corn who understands the babbling rills the weird wild music of the hills and nameless voices heaven-born sure am i that the antrim glen holds mysteries beyond our ken and that there moves in wind and sea and rock and stream and weed and tree a life not far from the life of men dear mother earth i know within that leaf and i are next of kin the rowan high by blood is near 
the primrose is a sister dear brother of mine the mountain wind now on the ocean shore i stand the sea-worn cliff on either hand and farther north no other land only the long sea heave and roll between me and the arctic pole end of the nine green glens this recording is in the public domain Lough Bray one by rose kavanagh from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england a little lonely moorland lake its waters brown and cool and deep the cliff the hills behind it make a picture for my heart to keep for rock and heather wave and strand war tints i never saw them where the, the june sunshine was o'er the land before twas never half so fair the amber ripples sang all day and singing spilled their crowns of white upon the beach in thin pale spray that streaked the sober strand with light the amber ripples sang their song when suddenly from far o'erhead a lark's pure voice mixed with the throng of lovely things about us spread some flowers were there so near the brink their shadows in the wave were thrown while mosses green and grey and pink grew thickly round each smooth dark stone and over all the summer sky shut out the town we left behind twas joy to stand in silence by one bright chain linking mind to mind oh little lonely mountain spot your place within my heart will be apart from all life's busy lot a true sweet solemn memory end of lough bray one this recording is in the public domain lough bray two by standish o'grady from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england no memory false spendthrift memory disloyal treasure keeper of the soul this vision chain shall never wrong from thee nor wasteful years effacing as they roll o oh, steel blue lake high cradled in the hills o oh, sad waves filled with little sobs and cries white glistening shingle hiss of mounting rills and granite hearted walls blotting the skies shine sob gleam gloom for ever o oh, in me be what you are in nature a recess to sadness dedicate the mystery within afar in the soul's wilderness still let my thoughts leaving the worldly roar like pilgrims wander on thy haunted shore end of lough bray two this recording is in the public domain an awakening from the book of irish poetry part one Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. An Awakening by Alice Furlong. O oh, spring will waken the heart of me with the rapture of blown violets. When the green bud quickens on every tree, the spring will waken the heart of me. And dews of honey will rain on the lea, tangling the grasses in silver nets. Yes, spring will waken the heart of me with the rapture of blown violets end of an awakening this recording is in the public domain the little waves of brefni from the book of irish poetry part 1 read for librivox.org by sonia the little waves of brefni by eva gore booth the grand road from the mountain goes shining to the sea and there is traffic in it and many a horse and cart but the little roads of cluno are dearer far to me 
and the little roads of cluna go rambling through my heart a great storm from the ocean goes shouting over the hill and there is glory in it and terror on the wind but the haunted air of twilight is very strange and still and the little winds of twilight are dearer to my mind the great waves of the atlantic sweep storming on their way shining green and silver with the hidden herring shoal but the little waves of brefni have drenched my heart in spray and the little waves of brefni go stumbling through my soul end of the little waves of brefni this recording is in the public domain On Great Sugarloaf From the Book of Irish Poetry Part One Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia On Great Sugarloaf by George A. Green Where Sugarloaf with bare and ruinous wedge Cleaves the grey air to view the darkening sea We stood on high and heard the north wind flee Through clouds storm heavy fallen from ledge to ledge Then sudden look we cried the far black edge of south horizon oped in sunbright glee and the broad water shone one moment free ere darkness veiled again the wavering sedge such is the poet's inspiration still too evanescent coming but to go such the great passions showing good in ill quick brightnesses love lights too burned low and such man's life which flashes heaven's will between two glooms a transitory glow end of on great sugarloaf this recording is in the public domain a june day from the book of irish poetry part 1 read for librivox.org by sonia a june day by john todhunter the very spirit of summer breathes to-day here where i sun me in a dreamy mood and laps the sultry lees and seems to brood tenderly over those hazed hills far away the air is fragrant with the new-mown hay and drowsed with hum of myriad flies pursued by twittering martins all yon hillside wood is drowned in sunshine till its green looks grey no scrap of cloud is in the still blue sky vaporous with heat from which the foreground trees stand out each leaf cut sharp the wetted scythe makes rustic music for me as i lie watching the gambols of the children blithe drinking the season's sweetness to the lees end of a june day this recording is in the public domain The Swimmer by Rhoda Noel From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England Who would linger idle, dallying would lie When wind and wave a bridal celebrating fly Let him plunge among them who hath wooed enough flirted with them sung them in the salt sea trough he may win them onward on a buoyant crest far to seaward sunward ocean born to rest wild wind will sing over him on a blithe sea bosom swims another too swims a live sea blossom a grey winged sea view great green all the waves are by whose hurrying line Half of ships and caves are buried under brine. Supple shifting ranges, loosened at the crest, With pearly surface changes, never laid to rest. Now a dipping gunwale, momently he sees. Now a fuming funnel, or red flag in the breeze. Arms flung open wide, lip the laughing sea, For playfellow, for bride claim her impetuously triumphantly exult with all the free buoyant 
bounding splendour of the sea and if while on the billow we airily he lay his awful wild playfellow filled his mouth with spray reft him of his breath to some far realms away he would float with death wild wind would sing over him and the free foam over him waft him sleeping sunward all alone with death ah alone with death in a realm of wondrous dreams and shadow haunted ocean gleams end of the swimmer this recording is in the public domain spring the travelling man by winifred m letts from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england spring the travelling man has been here here in the glen he must have passed by in the grey of the dawn when only the robin and wren were awake watching out with their bright little eyes in the midst of the brake the rabbits maybe heard him pass stepping light on the grass whistling careless and gay at the break o the day then the blackthorn to give him delight put on raiment of white and all for his sake the gorse on the hill when he rested an hour grew bright with a splendour of flower my grief that i was not aware of himself being there it is i would have given my dower to have seen him set forth whistling careless and gay in the grey of the morn by gorse bush and frohan and thorn on his way to the north end of spring the travelling man this recording is in the public domain a fine day on loch swilly by william alexander from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england soft slept the beautiful autumn in the heart on the face on the loch its heart whose pulses were hushed till you knew the life of the tide but by a wash on the shore a whisper like whispering leaves in green abysses of forest its face whose violet melted melted in roseate gold roses and violets dying into a tender mystery of soft impalpable haze calm lay the woodlands of fan the summer was gone yet it lay on the gently yellowing leaves like the beautiful poem whose tones are mute whose words are forgot but its music sleepeth for ever within the music of thought the robin sang from the ash the sunset's pencils of gold no longer wrote their great lines on the bowls of the odorous limes or bathed the tree-tops in glory but a soft strange radiance there hung in splinters of tenderest light and those whose look it from glengollen saw the purple wall of the scalp as if through an old church window stain it with a marvellous blue from the snow-white shell strand of inch you could not behold the white horses lifting their glittering backs tossing their manes on dunry and the battle of macamish was lulled in the delicate air as in old pictures the smoke goes up from abraham's pyre so the smoke went up from rathmullen and beyond the trail of the smoke was a great deep fiery abyss of molten gold in the sky and it set a far track up the waters ablaze with gold like its own over the fire of the sea over the chasm in the sky my spirit as by a bridge of wonder went wandering on and lost its way in the heaven end of a fine day on loch swilly this recording 
is in the public domain. Frost Morning by William Alexander From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England The morn is cold, a whiteness newly brought Lightly and loosely powders every place The panes among yon trees that eastward face Flash rosy fire from the opposite dawning court As the face flashes with a splendid thought As the heart flashes with a touch of grace When heaven's light comes on ways we cannot trace Unsought yet lovelier than we ever sought In the blue northern sky is a pale moon Through whose thin texture something doth appear Like the dark shadow of a branchy tree Fit morning for the prayers of one like me, whose life is in midwinter, and must soon come to the shortest day of all my year. End of the Frost Morning. This recording is in the public domain. The Wind from the West by Ella Young. From the Book of Irish Poetry. Part One, read for LibriVox.org, recording by Elaine Conway, England. Blow high, blow low, O wind from the west, you come from the country, I love the best. O oh, say, have the lilies yet lifted their heads above the lake water that ripples and spreads? Do the little sedges still shake with delight and whisper together? All through the night have the mountains the purple i used to love and peace about them around and above a oh, wind from the west blow high blow low you come from the country i loved long ago end of the wind from the west this recording is in the public domain to the mountain ben Balban. From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia To the Mountain, Ben Balban By Maureen Fox I would I were a wide-winged hawk, Beloved, with all the silence Of thy peaks my own, Hovering above thy fragrant Sun-steeped valleys, Or on salt winds From height to headland blown. I would I were a little wind Of night-time, all the great winds blow through the upper skies, but I would wander where through dew start myrtle, like faint moon flames, thy secret thoughts arise. I would I were a falling star, beloved, one of a host exultant, swift and free, then would I burn the sundering leagues of darkness, and flaming to thy heart be lost in thee. End of To the Mountain Ben Balban. This recording is in the public domain. Anach from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Anach by Daryl Figgis. There is no peace now, however things go. No peace where the ways of men ring loud safe in a secret place that i know hidden as in a cloud all the high hills stand clustering round arch to protect it from trouble and noise the great strong hills that sing without sound and speak with no voice there lies carrog the mute low lake and banna Frauer lying aloft peacefully sleeping or even if they wake lapping low and soft upon the high hilltops the heather may be crying and over the hilltops the voices of men are heard but here only water lapping and sighing or the wail of a bird peace peace and peace from the inner heart of dream more full of wisdom than speech can tell dropped like a veil round the show of things that seem with an invisible spell.
End of Anach. This recording is in the public domain. The Fairy's Lullaby from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Fairy's Lullaby from the Gaelic by Eleanor Hull. My mirth and merriment, soft and sweet art thou, child of the race of Con art thou. My mirth and merriment, soft and sweet art thou, of the race of Col and Con art thou. My smooth green rush, my laughter sweet, my little plant in the rocky cleft, were it not for the spell on thy tiny feet, thou wouldst not here be left, not thou. Of the race of Col and Con art thou, my laughter sweet and low art thou, as you crow on my knee, I would lift you with me, were it not for the mark that is on your feet, I would lift you away, and away, with me. End of the Fairy's Lullaby This recording is in the public domain. The Fairy Host From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Fairy Host from the Irish tale Logger MacCrimmon's Visit to the Fairy Realm of Magmel. Pure white the shields their arms upbear, with silver emblems rare overcast. Amid blue glittering blades they go, the horns they blow are loud of blast. In well instructed ranks of war, before their chief they proudly pace, cerulean spears over every crest, a curly tressed pale visaged race. Beneath the flame of their attack, bare and black turns every coast. With such a terror to the fight, flashes that mighty vengeful host. Small wonder that their strength is great, since royal in estate are all. Each hero's head a lion's fell, a golden yellow mane lets fall. Comely and smooth their bodies are, their eyes the starry blue eclipse. The pure white crystal of their teeth laughs out beneath their thin red lips. Good are they at man's laying feats, melodious over meats and ale. Of woven verse they wield the spell, at chesscraft they excel the gale. End of the Fairy Host This recording is in the public domain. The Song of the Fairies from the Book of Irish Poetry Part One Read for Librivox dot org by Sonia The Song of the Fairies When they made the road across the bog of Lamrach for the King Medir from the Irish by A. H. Leary Pile on the soil, thrust on the soil, red are the oxen around to toil, heavy the troops that my words obey, heavy they seem, and yet men are they. Strongly as piles are the tree trunks placed, red are the wattles above them laced, tired are your hands and your glances slant, one woman's winning this toil may grant. Oxen are ye, but revenge shall see, men who are white shall your servants be, rushes from Tefa are cleared away, grief is the price that the man shall pay, stones have been cleared from the rough meath ground. Where shall the gain or the harm be found? Thrust it in hand, force it in hand, Nobles this night as an ox troop stand. Hard is the task that is asked, and who, From the bridging of Lamrach, shall gain or rue? End of the Song of the Fairies This recording is in the public domain. Sea Maiden's Vengeance by George Sigerson, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org, recording by Elaine Conway, England. A great gallant king of yore ruled shore and sea of Erin. Noble then all section shone, neath Rigdon, son of daring. O'er oh, the main of slow grey seas, with a breeze, lay his hallway, to behold his foreign friend, 
he would wend north to norway spared his splendid vessels three when the sea calmed its motion till they sailing sudden stop on the ridgy top of ocean they refused to wend away fixed they lay nowhere faring then into the dark deep deeps rurad leaps greatly daring when he dived for their release through the sea's surging waters there he found the forms divine of its nine beauteous daughters these with clear soft accents said it was they stayed his sailing that to leave nine maidens sweet where feet few prevailing he with these nine nymphs remained where there reigned shade nor sadness neath the waters where no wave ever gave gloom to gladness one of these his bride became still his fame forced him forward but he vowed to greet her lips when his ships came from norward once on board he bade them sail past the pale billows breaking and with one bound make their course to the norse of quick speaking o'er the salt sea then they rode and abode sweet the story till the seventh glade year ends with their friends great in glory ruad then ran out once more on the hoar salt sea faring speeding forth his ships to reach to the bright far beach of erin warped and wrong the royal will solemn still is promise spoken he should have gone to the maid as he said no pledge have broken when the prince of tured's name unto mured's borders came around the shore foul his fame a sound arose of sad acclaim twas the sweet voiced women's song borne along in music's motion following ruat's fleeing sail or wail of wave-worn ocean sailing in bronze boat they came no flank frame made by mortal those nine maidens fair and fierce till they pierce albin's portal dire and dread the deed then done there by one mid the water ruad's son her own she slew vengeance knew sweet in slaughter then upraising high her hand forth she cast him on the strand shrank the shore and shuddering foam from king ruad's welcome home end of sea maiden's vengeance this recording is in the public domain song of male doing by thomas william rolleston from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england there are veils that lift there are bars that fall there are lights that beacon and winds that call good-bye there are hurrying feet and who dare not wait for the hour is on us the hour of fate the circling hour of the flaming gate good-bye 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 ay fair fair they shine through the burning zone the rainbow gleams of a world unknown good-bye and oh to follow to seek to dare when step by step in the evening air floats down to meet us the cloudy stare good-bye 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 the cloudy stare of the brig o oh dread is the dizzy path that our feet must tread good-bye o oh children of time o oh nights and days that gather and wander and stand and gaze and wheeling stars in your lonely ways good-bye 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 the music calls and the gates unclose onward and onward the wild way goes good-bye we die in the bliss of a great new birth o oh, fading phantoms of pain and birth o oh, fading loves of the old green earth good-bye 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 end of the song of male doing this recording is in the public domain
The Island of Sleep by William Butler Yeats From the Book of Irish Poetry Part One Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England Fled foam underneath us and round us A wandering and milky smoke High as the saddle girth covering away From our glance the tide And those that fled and that followed From the foam pale distance broke The immortal desire of immortals We saw in their faces and sighed Amused on the chase with the Fenians and Bran, Sigolan, Loma, and never a song sang Neum, and over my finger tips came now the sliding of tears, and sweeping of mist cold hair, and now the warmth of sighs, and after the quiver of lips, were we days long or hours long in riding, when rolled in a grisly peace, an isle lay level before us with dripping hazel and oak and we stood on a sea's edge we saw not for whiter than new-washed fleece fled foam underneath us and around us a wandering and milky smoke and we rode on the plains of the sea's edge the sea's edge barren and grey grey sand on the green of the grasses and over the dripping trees dripping and doubling landward as though they would hasten away like an army of old men longing for rest from the moan of the seas but the trees grew taller and closer immense in their wrinkling bark dropping a murmurous dropping old silence and that one sound for no live creature lived there no weasels moved in the dark long sighs arose in our spirits beneath us bubbled the ground and the ears of the horse went sinking away in the hollow night for as drift from a sailor's slow drowning the gleams of the world and the sea and the sun ceased on our hands and our faces on hazel and oak leaf the light and the stars were blotted above us and the whole of the world was one till the horse gave a whinny for cumbrous with stems of the hazel and oak a valley flowed down from his hoofs and there in the long grass lay under the starlight and shadow a monstrous slumbering folk their naked and gleaming bodies poured out and heaped in the way and by them were arrow and war-axe arrow and shield and blade and dew-blanched horns in whose hollow a child of three years old could sleep on a couch of rushes and all inwrought and inlaid and more comely than man can make them with bronze and silver and gold and each of the huge white creatures was huger than four score men the tops of their ears were feathered their hands were the claw of birds and shaking the plumes of the grasses and the leaves of the mural glen the breathing came from those bodies long warless grown whiter than curds the wood was so spacious above them that he who had stars for his flocks gold found all the leaves with his fingers nor go from his dew-cumbered skies so long were they sleeping the owls had builded their nests in their locks filling the fibrous dimness with long generations of eyes and over the limbs and the valley the slow owls wandered and came now in a place of starfire and now in a shadow place wide and the chief of the huge white creatures his knees in his soft star flame lay loose in the place of shadow we drew the reins by his side gold in the nails of his bird claws flung loosely along the dim ground in one was a branch soft shining with bowels more many than sighs in midst of an old man's bosom owls ruffling and pacing around sidled their bodies against him filling the shade with their eyes and my gaze was thronged with the sleepers no neithering house of a can in a realm where the handsome are many or in glamours by demons flung are faces alive with such beauty made known to the salt eye of man yet weary with passions that faded when the sevenfold seas were young 
and i gazed on the bell branch sleep's forebear far sung by the senakis i saw how they slumbered grown weary their camping in grasses deep of wars with the wide world and pacing the shores of the wandering seas laid hands on the bell branch and swayed it and fed of unhuman sleep snatching the born of neum i blew a lingering note came sound from those monstrous sleepers a sound like the stirring of flies he shaking the fold of his lips and heaving the pillar of his throat watched me with mournful wonder out of the wells of his eyes i cried come out of the shadow can of the fails of gold and tell of your goodly household and the goodly works of your hands that we may muse in the starlight and talk of the battles of old your questioner oisin is worthy he comes from the fenian lands half open his eyes were and held me dull with smoke of their dreams his lips moved slowly in answer no answer out of them came and he swayed in his fingers the bell branch slow dropping a sound in faint streams softer than snowflakes in april and piercing the marrow like flame wrapped in the wave of that music with weariness more than of earth the moiler of my centuries filled me and gone like a sea-covered stone with the memories of the whole of my sorrow and the memories of the whole of my mirth and a softness came from the starlight and filled me full to the bone in the roots of the grasses the sorrels i laid my body as low and the pearl pale neum lay by me her brow on the midst of my breast and the horse was gone in the distance and years after years gan flow square leaves of the ivy moved over us binding us down to our rest and man of the many white croziers a sentry there i forgot how the fetlocks drip blood in the battle when the fallen on fallen lie rolled how the falconer follows the vulcan in the weeds of the heron's plot and the names of the demons whose hammers made armour from conhor of old and man of the many white groziers a sentry there i forgot that the spear-shaft is made out of ashwood the shield out of osier and hide how the hammers spring on the anvil on the spearhead's burning spot how the slow blue-eyed oxen of finn low sadly at evening tide but in dreams mild man of the croziers driving the dust with their throngs moved round me of seamen or landsmen all who are winter tales came by me the cans of the red branch with roaring of laughter and songs or moved as they moved once love-making or piercing the tempest with sails came blanid came blanid macnessa tall fergus who feastward of old time slunk cook barrack the traitor and warward the spittle on his beard never dry dark bella as old as a forest carborn his mighty head sunk helpless men lifting the lids of his weary and death-making eye and by me in soft red raiment the fenians moved in loud streams and grania walking and smiling sewed with a needle of bone so lived i and lived not so wrought i and wrought not with creatures of dreams in a long iron sleep as a fish in the water goes dumb as a stone end of the island of sleep this recording is in the public domain On the Waters of Moyle by George Sigerson from the Book of Irish Poetry Part One Read for Librivox dot org Recording by Elaine Conway England Translated from the Irish Time passed pleasantly with the swan children on the lake in the day they conversed with their kindred and friends who had encamped round at night they sang slow sweet fairy music that made sorrow sleep this term closed they bade farewell to all 
and went forth to the waters of moil where they suffered from icy storms finula covering her young brothers with her wings sang life is weary here great the snowing here night is dreary here bleak the blowing here on a day they saw a fairy calfcade at the river banner and were told that lear and their friends were celebrating the feast of age happy but for their absence finula made this lay gay this night lear's royal house chiefs carouse mead flows amain cold this night his children roam chill home the icy main for our mantles fair our foined feathers curving round our breasts oft in silken robes we had purple clad we sat at feasts for our viands here and wine bitter brine and pallid sands oft the hazel mead they serve in carved vessels to our hands now our beds are the bare rock smit with shock of heavy seas often soft breast down will spread for the bed of grateful ease though tis now in frost our toil to swim moil with drooping wings oft we rode as royal wards and our guards were sons of kings end of on the waters of moil this recording is in the public domain The Return of the Children of Lear by George Sigerson From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England In the extremity of their suffering, frozen in Erish Sea, the brothers were inconsolable. Fionola asked them to believe in the true God, and they were relieved and suffered no more at the end of their final term they arose and went very lightly and airily towards the city of their father and thus they found the place void desolate with naught but the bare green paths and forests of nettles without house without fire without tribes then the four drew close together and thrice they raised on high the cry of wailing then fionula spoke this lay strange is all this place to me no house no home no gladness as tis thus this place to see alas my heart what sadness i no bound no sound no ember no group where princes gather not thus do we remember its old days with our father no horn no goblet dancing no halls of light each morrow no youth no proud steed prancing all signs portentous sorrow all the void that here i see alas my pain grows stronger makes it this night clear to me its loved lord lives no longer city where of old we knew or arts of joy exerted what a fate of woe and rue thou art this night deserted dark our doom and tragical condemned the waves to wander near such ill fate magical did mortal yet fall under now the city populous gives weeds and woods its favour no man lives who'd welcome us to this our homestead ever End of The Return of the Children of Lear This recording is in the public domain. The Sea God's Address to Bran by W. M. Hennessy From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England from the early irish to bran as in his coracle he glide a level of blue tides appears the deep when o'er my shadowy steeds i lose the rein a flowery plain my chariot seems to sweep yea what to bran uplifted on the prancing of his proud skiff is smooth blue glancing sec 
beneath this burning chariot of two wheels a breadth of bloom delightful laughs for me brown from his skiff side views the joyous onset of waves red crested in the sunset glow i see over all the plain of sports flower bedded of crimson headed flowers the faultless flow sea horses glisten in the ocean azure far as brown's eyes can measure but to mine rivers a stream of honey bright are pouring for storing in my land beyond the brine brilliant the sea whereon the skiff is guided dazzling the surf divided by thine hand yellow and azure its white brightness fairy it is indeed a light and airy land the speckled salmon from the wave outleaping where bran goes sweeping through the ocean's wilds are calves and lambs nor fishes of the water we slaughter ne'er our patty of peace defiles and though thou seest but one lone chariot rider a glider o'er the full bloomed pleasant plain from countless viewless steeds and chariots golden thine eyes are holden by the mocking main large is the plain with happy hosts tis crowded its colours in unclouded glory fall a stream of silver stairs of golden splendour a full free welcome tender unto all a joyous game enchanting and delicious above the luscious wine is featly played by men and gentle women set in session without transgression in the leafy shade along a woodland's top that greenly bridges blue airy ridges has thy carrow swum beneath thy very prow its shade in peaches with blushing peaches the empurpled plum a wood where vagrant fruit and flower are wreathing with clusters of the fragrant breathing vine a wood of foliage rich and golden rain a wood without decaying or decline we have been here since first the earth had been yet neither seeing here old age nor death and hence we fear not any base beginning of mortal sinning shall cut short our breath then let not bran relax his steadfast rowing the land of women shall be showing soon yea even a bright with every joyful blessing he shall be pressing ere the rise of moon end of the sea god's address to bran this recording is in the public domain. The Spear of Kaltar by W. M. Hennessy From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England The following nearly literal version from the ancient tale of the Bruridin Durga gives an idea of the fabled weapons of the Irish heroes. The famous sword of Finn was the child of this terrible spear. What further sawest thou? By the royal chair, a couch I saw. Three heroes sat thereon. In their first greyness, they grey dark their robes, grey dark their swords, enormous of an edge, to slice the hair on water. He who sits midmost of three grasps with both hands the spear of fifty rivets and so sways and swings the weapon which would else give forth its shout of conflict but he keeps it in thrice essaying to escape his hands it doubles darting on him heel to point a cauldron at his feet big as the vat of a king's guest house in that vat pool hideous to look upon liquor black wherein he dips and cools the blade by times else all its shaft would blaze as though a fire had wrapped the king post of the house in flame resolve me now and say what was i saw not hard to say these champion warriors three are senka beauteous son of ilio 
Dubthak, the fierce Ulidian, Adakok, and Goibnen, son of the Ugnech, and the spear. In hands of Dubthak is the famous Lon of Kelta, son of Oitika, which erst some wizard of the Tuath de Danan brought to battle at Moitura, and there lost found after and these motions of the spear and sudden sallies hard to be restrained affect it oft as blood of enemies is ripe for spilling at a cauldron then full of which brewage needs must be at hand to quench it when the homicidal act is by its blade expected quench it not it blazes up even in the holder's hand and through the holder and the door planks through flies forth to sate itself in massacre end of the spear of calta this recording is in the public domain the legend of fergus lederson by sir samuel ferguson from the book of irish poetry part one Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. From an unknown bard of the tenth century. One day, King Fergus, lead Luthmar's son, drove by Loch Ruri at his journey done, slept in his chariot, wearied, while he slept a troop of fairies, o'er his cushion crept and first his sharp dread sword they filched away then bore himself feet forward to the bay he with a chill touch woke and at a snatch it fortuned him in either hand to catch a full-grown sprite while twixt his breast and arm he pinned a youngling they in dire alarm writhed hard and squealed he held tighter then quarter and ransom cried the little men no quarter he nor go ye hence alive unless ye gift me wit the art to dive long as i will to walk at large and breathe the seas the locks the river floods beneath we will he loosed them herbs of virtue they placed in his ear holes or as others say a hood of fairy texture o'er his head much like a cleric's cochal drew and said wear this and walk the deeps and well beware thou enter no wise in loch rury there clad in his cowl through many deeps he went and saw their wonders but was not content unless loch rury also to his eyes revealed its inner under mysteries thither he came and plunged therein and there the murderists met him have you seen a pair of blacksmith's bellows open out and close alternate neath the hand of him that blows so swelled it and so shrunk the hideous sight hung all his visage sideways with affright he fled he gained the bank how seems my cheer o mowina ill replied the charioteer but rest thee sleep thy wildness will compose he slept swift mowina to amania goes whom now for king since fergus's face awry but law demeans him of the sovereignty hush and his sages and physicians wise in earnest counsel sit and this advice he knows not of his plight to keep him so as he suspect not that he ought to know for so the mind be straight and just towards wait on the judgment right read law regards no mere distortion of the outward frame as blemish borrowing from the kingly name and know he all the baleful fact you tell an inward wrench might warp the mind as well behoves it therefore all of idle tongue jesters and women and the witless young be from his presence kept and when at morn he takes his bath behoves his bondmaid dom 
muddy the water test perchance he trace lost kingship's token on his imaged face three years they kept him so till on a day dom with his face bath ewa had made delay and fretted fergus petulant and rash a blow bestowed her of his horsewhip lash forth burst the woman's anger thou a king thou sit in council thou a judge a thing in court of law thou who no kingship can since all may see thou art a blemished man thou wry mouth fergus thereon slew the maid and to lochrury's brink in haste conveyed went in at verte for a day and night beneath the waves he rested out of sight but all the Ortonians on the bank who stood saw the lock boil and redden with the blood when next at sunrise skies grew also red he rose and in his hand the muodress's head gone was the blemish on his goodly face each trait symmetric had resumed its place and they who saw him marked in all his mien a king's composure ample and serene he smiled he cast his trophy to the bank cried i survivor ola terian and sank end of the spear of Kaltar. this recording is in the public domain Deirdre Dancing by Herbert Trench From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England Nao is, wilt thou not dance? Daughter of heaven, today free, at last free? For here no moody raindrop can reach thee, nor betrayer over peer and none the self-delightful measure here that thy soul moves to quitter of mortal ear full love she pleads yet cannot him resist and on the immossed lights begins to dance away away far floating like a mist to fade into some leafy brilliance then smiling to the inward melodist over the printless turf with slow advance of showery footsteps makes she infinite that crowded glen but quick possessed by strange rapture wider than dreams her motions range till to a span the forest shrink and change and in her eyes and glimmering arms she brings hither all promise all the unlooked for boon of rainbowed life all rare and speechless things that shine and swell under the brimming moon who shall pluck tympans for what need of strings to waft her blood who is herself the tune herself the warm and breathing melody art comes from the land of ever young oh stay for his heart after thee rising away falls dark and spirit faint back to the clay griefs like the yellow leaves by winter curled rise after her long buried pangs arouse about that bosom the grey forests whirled and tempests with her beauty might espouse she rose with the green waters of the world and the winds heaved with her their depth of boughs then vague again as blows the bean-field's odour on the dark lap of air she chose to sink as winnowing with plumes to the river bank the pigeons from the cliff came down to drink sudden distraught shading her eyes she ceased listening like bride whom cunning fairy strain forth from the trumpet bruited spousal feast steals but he beckoned soon and quick with pain he ran he craved at those white feet the least pardon nor till he felt her hand again descend flake soft durst spy that she was weeping or kneel with burning murmurs to atone for sleep she wept long fasting had they gone and ridden from the breaking of the dawn end of deirdre dancing
This recording is in the public domain. The Noble Lay of Aelin by Stopford A. Brooke from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. After an Irish tale from the Book of Lincia, Prince Bale of Ulster rode out in the mon to meet his love at the ford, and he loved her better than lands or life, and dearer than his sword, and she was Aelin, fair as the sea, the prince of Leinster's daughter, and she longed for him more than a wounded man, who sees death, longs for water. They sent a message each to each, oh, meet me near or far, and the ford divided the kingdoms too, and the kings were bolics at war and the prince came first to the water's pass and oh he thought no ill when he saw with pain a great grey man come striding o'er the hill his cloak was the ragged thunder-cloud and his cap the whirling snow and his eyes were the lightning in the storm and his horn he gan to blow what news what news thou great grey man I fear tis ill with me, O oh, Aelin is dead, and her lips are cold, and she died for loving thee. And he looked and saw no more the man, but a trail of driving rain. Woe, woe, he cried, and took his sword, and drave his heart in twain, and out of his blood burst forth a spring, and a yew tree out of his breast. And it grew so deep, and it grew so high, The doves came near to rest, But Aelin was coming to keep her tryst. The hour her lover fell, And she rode as fast as the western wind Across the heathery hill. Behind her flew her loosened hair, Her happy heart did beat, When she was ware of a cloud of storm, Came driving down the street, And out of it stepped a great grey man, And his cap was peaked with snow the fire of death was in his eyes and he gan his horn to blow what news what news thou great grey man and is it ill to me oh bell the prince is dead at the ford and he died for loving thee pale pale she grew and two large tears dropped down like heavy rain and she fell to earth with a woeful cry for she broke her heart in twain and out of her tears two fountains rose that watered all the ground and out of her heart an apple tree grew that hurt the water's sand oh woe were the kings and woe were the queens and woe were the people all and the poets sang their love and their death in cottage and in hall and the men of ulster a tablet made from the wood of bailey's tree and the men of Leinster did the like of Aelin's apple tree, and on the one the poets wrote the lover tales of Leinster, and on the other all the deeds that lover wrought in Ulster. Now, when a hundred years had gone, the king of all the land kept feast at Tara, and he bade his poets sing a strand. They sang the sweet unhappy tale, the noble Aelin's lay. Go bring the tablets cried the king for i have wept to-day but when he held in his right hand the wood of bailis tree and in his left the tablet smooth from aelin's apple tree the lovers in the wood who kept love longing ever true knew one another and at once from the hands of the king they flew as ivy to the oak they clung their kiss no man could sever O oh, joy for lovers parted long to meet at last for ever End of the Noble Lay of Aelin This recording is in the public domain The Love Talker by Ethna Carberry From the Book of Irish Poetry Part One Read for Librivox dot org Recording by Elaine Conway, England 
I met the love talker one eve in the glen. He was handsomer than any of our handsome young men. His eyes were blacker than the slow, his voice sweeter far than the crooning of old. Kevin's pipes beyond in cool Nagar. I was bound for the milking with a heart fair and free. My grief, that bitter hour, drained the life for me. I thought him human lover, though his lips on mine were cold, and the breath of death blew keen on me within his hold. I know not what way he came, no shadow fell behind, but all the sighing rushes swayed beneath a fairy wind. The thrush ceased its singing, a mist crept about. We two clung together, with the world shut out, beyond the ghostly mist. I could hear my cattle low, the little cow from Balina, clean as driven slow, the dun cow from Kerry, the roan from Inishir. Oh, pitiful their calling, and his whispers in my ear. His eyes were a fire, his words were a snare. I cried my mother's name, but no help was there. I made the blessed sign, then he gave a dreary moan. A wisp of cloud went floating by. And I stood alone, running ever through my head, is an old-time rune, who meets the love-talker, must weave her shroud soon. My mother's face is furrowed, with the salt tears that fall, but the kind eyes of my father are the saddest sight of all. I have spun the fleecy lint, and now my wheel is still, the linen length is woven, for my shroud fine and chill. I shall stretch me on the bed, where a happy maid I lay, pray for the soul of Mare Og at dawning of the day. End of the Love Talker This recording is in the public domain. To the Lean and She by Thomas Boyd From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England Where is thy lovely perilous abode? In what strange phantom land Glimmer the fairy turrets where two rode The ill-starred poet band? Say, in the Isle of Youth, hast thou thy home? The sweetest singer there, stealing on winged steed Across the foam? A through the moonlit air, and by the gloomy peaks of Erigal, haunted by storm and cloud, wing past to thy lover there, let fall his singing robe and shroud, or where the mists of bluebell float beneath the red stems of the pine, and sunbeams strike through shadow, dost thou breathe the word that makes him thine, or is thy palace entered through? Some cliff when radiant tides are full, And around thy lover's wandering, Starlit skiff, coil in luxurious lull, And would he, entering on the brimming flood, See caverns vast in height, And diamond columns, crowned with leaf and bud, Glow in long lanes of light, And there the pearl of that great glittering shell, Trembling, behold thee lone, now weaving in slow dance an awful spell, Now still upon thy throne. Thy beauty, ah, the eyes that pierce him through, Then melt as in a dream. The voice that sings the mysteries of the blue, And all that be and seem. Thy lovely motions answering to the rhyme That ancient nature sings, That keeps the stars in cadence for all time, And echoes through all things. Whether he sees thee thus, or in his dreams, Thy light makes all lights dim, An aching solitude from henceforth seems The world of men to him. Thy luring song, above the sensuous roar, He follows with delight, Shutting behind him life's last gloomy door, And fares into the night. End of To the Lean and She this recording is in the public domain. The King's Son by Thomas Boyd 
from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england who rideth through the driving rain at such a headlong speed naked and pale he rides a mane upon a naked steed nor hollow nor height his going bars his wet steed shines like silk his head is golden to the stars and his limbs are white as milk but lo he dwindles as the light that lifts from a black mere and as the fair youth wanes from sight the steed grows mightier what wizard by yon holy tree mutters unto the sky where Macus flame-tongued horses flee on hoofs of thunder by ah tis not wholly so to ban the youth of kingly seed ah woe the wasting of a man who changes to a steed nightly upon the plain of kings when matches day is nigh he gallops and the dark wind brings his lonely human cry end of the king's son this recording is in the public domain little sister by thomas boyd from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england little sister whom the fay hides away within his doom deep below yon tufted fern oh list and learn my magic tune long ago when snared like thee by the she my harp and i o oh, them wove the sombre spell warbling well its lullaby till with dreamy smiles they sank rank on rank before the strain then i rose from out the wrath and found my path to earth again little sister to my woe hid below among the she list and learn my magic tune that it full soon may succour thee end of little sister this recording is in the public domain the fairy thorn an ulster ballad from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org get up arana dear from the weary spinning wheel for your father's on the hill and your mother is asleep come up above the crags and we'll dance a highland reel around the fairy thorn on the steep at anna grace's door twas thus the maidens cried three merry maidens fair in kirtles of the green and anna laid the rock and the weary wheel aside the fairest of the four i ween there glancing through the glimmer of the quiet eve away in milky wavings of neck and ankle bare the heavy sliding stream in its sleepy song they leave and the crags in the ghostly air and linking hand in hand and singing as they go the maids along the hillside have taken their fearless way till they come to where the rowan trees in lonely beauty grow beside the fairy hawthorn grey the hawthorn stands between the ashes tall and slim like matron with her twin granddaughters at her knee the rowan berries cluster o'er her low head gray and dim in ruddy kisses sweet to see the merry maidens four have ranged them in a row between each lovely couple a stately rowan stem and away in mazes wavy like skimming birds they go o oh, never caroled bird like them but solemn is the silence of the silvery haze that drinks away their voices in echoless repose and dreamily the evening has stilled the haunted braes and dreamier the gloaming grows and sinking one by one like lark notes from the sky when the falcon shadow saileth across the open shaw are hushed the maiden's voices as cowering down they lie in the flutter of their sudden awe for from the air above and the grassy ground beneath and from the mountain ashes and the old white thorn between a power of faint enchantment doth through their beings breathe and they sink down together on the green 
they sink together silent, and stealing side by side, they fling their lovely arms o'er their drooping necks so fair, then vainly strive again their naked arms to hide, for their shrinking necks again are bare. Thus clasped and prostrate all, with their heads together bowed, soft o'er their bosoms beating, the only human sound. They hear the silky footsteps of the silent fairy crowd, like a river in the air gliding round. No scream can any raise, no prayer can any say, but wild, wild the terror of the speechless three. For they feel fair Anna Grace drawn silently away, by whom they dare not look to see. They feel their tresses twine with her parting locks of gold, and the curls elastic falling as her head withdraws. They feel her sliding arms from their trancid arms unfold, but they may not look to see the cause. For heavy on their senses the faint enchantment lies Through all that night of anguish and perilous amaze And neither fear nor wonder can ope their quivering eyes Or their limbs from the cold ground raise Till out of night the earth has rolled her dewy side With every haunted mountain and streamy vale below When as the mist dissolves in the yellow morning tide The maiden's trance dissolveth so then fly the ghastly three as swiftly as they may, and tell their tale of sorrow to anxious friends in vain. They pined away and died within the year and day, and ne'er was Anna Grace seen again. End of the Fairy Thorn. This recording is in the public domain. On All Souls Night From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. On All Souls Night by Dora Sigerson. Oh, mother, mother, I swept the hearth, I set his chair and whiteboard spread, I prayed for his coming to our kind lady when death's sad doors would let out the dead. A strange wind rattled the window pane, and down the lane a dog howled on. I called his name, and the candle flame burned dim. Press the hand the door latch upon. Dealish, dealish, my woe forever that I could not sever coward flesh from fear. I called his name, and the pale ghost came, but I was afraid to meet my dear. O oh, mother, mother, in tears I checked the sad hours past of the year that's over, till by God's grace I might see his face and hear the sound of his voice once more. The chair I sat from the cold and wet, he took when he came from unknown skies, of the land of the dead, on my bent brown head I felt the reproach of his saddened eyes. I closed my lids on my heart's desire, crouched by the fire, my voice was dumb. At my clean-swept hearth he had no mirth, and at my table he broke no crumb. Dealish, dealish! My woe forever that I could not sever coward flesh from fear. His chair put aside when the young cock cried, and I was afraid to meet my dear. End of On All Souls Night. This recording is in the public domain. The Ship from Tirnanog from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Anita Sloma Martinez. We two were alone by the sea, I and the man I loved with me. Our eyes were glad and our hearts beat high as we sat by the sea, my love and I. Till we looked afar and saw a ship, then white, white grew his ruddy lip, and strange, strange grew his eyes that saw into the heart of some deep awe. His hand that held this hand of mine Never a token gave nor sign, But lay as a babe's that is just dead. And I sat still and wondered, Nearer and nearer the white ship drew. Who was her captain, whence her crew? Her crew were men and women bright, With fair eyes full of unknown light. From far off Turnanog they came, Where they had heard my true love's name. 
the name the birds and waves had sung of one who must bide forever young. Strong white arms let down the boat, song rose up from many a throat, glad they were who soon had won a lovely new companion. They lowered the boat, and they entered her, and rowed to meet their passenger, rowed to the tune of a music strange that told of joy at the heart of change. I heard her keel on the pebbles gride, and she waited there till the turn of the tide, while they kept singing, singing clear, a song that was passing sweet to hear, a song that bound me in a chain away from any thought of pain. They paused at last in their sweet singing, and I saw their hands were beckoning. In a rhythm as sweet as the stilled songs that passed to the air from their silent tongues, he rose and kissed me on the face, and left me sitting in my place. Quiet, quiet, life and limb, I who was not called like him. Into the boat he entered grave, and the tide turned, and she rode the wave. And I saw him sitting at the prow, with a rose light about his brow. The boat drew nigh the ship again, with all its lovely women and men. I saw him enter the ship and stand, his hand held in the captain's hand. The captain, wonderful to see. With eyes a change in depth and blee, a change, a change for ever and day, blue and purple and black and gray, and hair like the weed that finds a home in the heart of a trail of white sea foam. I wist he was no mortal man, but he whose name is Mananan. They sailed away, they sailed away, out of the day, into the day. End of The Ship from Ternanog This recording is in the public domain. The Fairy's Passage From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Fairy's Passage by James Clarence Mangan Tap, 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 rap! Get up, gaffer fairy man! Hey. Who is there? The clock strikes three. Get up, do, gaffer. You are the very man we have been long, long, longing to see. The ferryman rises, growling and grumbling, and goes fum fumbling and stumbling and tumbling over the wares on his way to the door. But he sees no more than he saw before, till a voice is heard. Oh, ferryman, dear! Here we are waiting, all of us here. We are a wee, wee colony, we, some two hundred in all or three. Ferry us over the river Lee, ere dawn of day, and we will pay the most we may in our own wee way. Who are you? Whence came you? What place are you going to? Oh, we have dwelled over long in this land. The people get cross and are growing so knowing too. Nothing at all but they now understand. We are daily vanishing under the thunder Of some huge engine or iron wonder. That iron, ah, it has entered our souls. Your souls? Oh, ghouls! You queer little drolls! Do you mean? Good gaffer, do aid us with speed, For our time, like our stature, is short indeed. And a very long way we have to go, Eight or ten thousand miles or so, Hither and thither, and to and fro, With our pots and pans and little gold cans, But our light caravans run swifter than man's. Well, well, you may come, said the ferryman affably. Patrick, turn out and get ready the barge. Then again to the little folk, Though you seem laughably small, I don't mind if your coppers be large. Oh, dear, what a rushing, what pushing, what crushing, the watermen making vain efforts at hushing the hubbub the while, there followed these words. What clapping of boards, what strapping of cords, what stowing away of children and wives, and platters and mugs and spoons and knives, till all had safely got into the boat, and the ferryman, clad in his tip-top coat, and his wee little fairies were safely afloat. 
Then ding, 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 and cling, 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 how the coppers did ring in the tin pitcherling. Off then went the boat, at first very pleasantly, smoothly and so forth, but after a while it swayed and it swagged this and that way, and presently chest after chest and pile after pile of the little folks' goods began tossing and rolling and pitching like fun beyond fairy controlling. Oh, Mab, if the hubbub were great before, it was now some two or three million times more. Crash went the wee crocks and the clocks, and the locks of each little wee box were stove in by hard knocks. And then there were oaths and prayers and cries. Take care, see there, oh dear my eyes, I am killed, I am drowned, with groans and sighs, till to land they drew. Yoo-hoo! Pull, too! Till a rope through and through! And all's right anew. Now jump upon shore, ye queer little oddities. Hey, what is this? Where are they at all? Where are they? And where are their tiny commodities? Well, as I live. He looks blank as a wall. Poor fairy man. Round him and round him he gazes but only gets deeplier lost in the mazes of utter bewilderment. All, all are gone, and he stands alone, like a statue of stone, in a doldrum of wonder. He turns to steer, and a tinkling laugh salutes his ear with other odd sounds. Ha, 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 sit, sizzle, kui, kui, pa, pa, fizzy, gig, giggy, Pshee, sha, sha. Oh, ye thieves, ye thieves, ye rascally thieves, the good man cries. He turns to his pitcher, and there, alas, to his horror perceives that the little folk's mode of making him richer has been to pay him with withered leaves. End of The Fairy's Passage This recording is in the public domain. The Fairy Fiddler from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Fairy Fiddler by Nora Hopper. Tis I go fiddling, fiddling by weedy ways forlorn. I make the blackbird's music ere in his breast is born. The sleeping larks I waken twixt the midnight and the morn. No man alive has seen me, but women hear me play. Sometimes at the door or window, fiddling the soul's way, the child's soul and the Collins out of the covering clay. None of my fairy kinsmen make music with me now. Alone the rats I wander, or ride the white thorn bough. But the wild swans they know me, and the horse that draws the plough. End of the fairy fiddler. This recording is in the public domain. The Fairies from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Fairies by William Allingham. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a hunting for fear of little men. We folk, good folk, trooping all together, green jacket, red cap, and white owl's feather. Down along the rocky shore. Some make their home. They live on crispy pancakes of yellow tide foam. Some in the reeds of the black mountain lake with frogs for their watchdogs all night awake. High on the hilltop the old king sits. He is now so old and grey he's nigh lost his wits. With a bridge of white mist column kill he crosses on his stately journeys from Sleeve League to Rosses. Or going up with music on cold starry nights To sup with the queen of the gay northern lights. They stole little Bridget for seven years long. When she came down again, her friends were all gone. They took her lightly back between the night and morrow. They thought that she was fast asleep, but she was dead with sorrow. They have kept her ever since, deep within the lake, on a bed of flag-leaves, watching till she wake. 
by the craggy hillside, through the mosses bare, they have planted thorn trees for pleasure here and there. Is any man so daring as dig them up in spite, he shall find their sharpest thorns in his bed at night. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we dare and go a hunting for fear of little men. We folk, good folk, trooping all together, green jacket, red cap, and white owl's feather. End of the fairies. This recording is in the public domain. Hi Brazil, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Hi Brazil, by Gerald Griffin. On the ocean that hollows the rocks where you dwell, a shadowy land has appeared, as they tell. Men thought it a region of sunshine and rest, and they called it High Brazil, the Isle of the Blest. From year unto year on the ocean's blue rim, the beautiful spectre showed lovely and dim. The golden clouds curtained the deep where it lay, and it looked like an Eden away, far away. A peasant who heard of the wonderful tale in the breeze of the Orient loosened his sail. From Era the Holy he turned to the West, for though Era was holy, High Brazil was blessed. He heard not the voices that called from the shore, he heard not the rising wind's menacing roar. Home, kindred, and safety he left on that day, and he sped to High Brazil, away, far away. Morn rose on the deep, and that shadowy isle, over the faint rim of distance, reflected its smile. Noon burned on the wave, and that shadowy shore seemed lovely distant, and faint as before. Lone evening came down on the wondrous track, and to Ara again he looked timidly back. Oh, far on the verge of the ocean it lay, yet the Isle of the Blessed was away, far away. Rash dreamer, return, O oh, ye winds of the main, bear him back to his own peaceful era again. Rash fool, for a vision of fanciful bliss, to barter thy calm life of labor and peace. The warning of reason was spoken in vain. He never revisited era again. Night fell on the deep amidst tempest and spray, and he died on the waters, away, far away. End of High Brazil. This recording is in the public domain. The Heather Glen From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Heather Glen by George Sigerson There blooms a bonny flower upon the Heather Glen Though bright in sun, in shower, tis just as bright again I never can pass by it, I never dare go nigh it, My heart it won't be quiet, up the heather glen. Sing, O oh, the blooming heather, O oh, the heather glen, Where fairest fairies gather, To lure in mortal men. I never can pass by it, I never dare go nigh it, my heart it won't be quiet, up the heather glen. There sings a bonny linnet up the heather glen, the voice has magic in it, too sweet for mortal men. It brings joy doon before us, with winsome mellow chorus, but flies far too far over us, up the heather glen. Sing, O oh, the blooming heather, O oh, the heather glen, Where fairest fairies gather, To lure in mortal men. I never can pass by it, I never dare go nigh it, my heart, it won't be quiet, 
up the heather glen. Oh, might I pull the flower that's blooming in that glen. Nay, sorrows that could lower would make me sad again. And might I catch that linnet, my heart, my hope are in it. Oh, heaven itself I'd win it, up the heather glen. Sing, O oh, the blooming heather, O oh, the heather glen, Where fairest fairies gather To lure in mortal men. I never can pass by it, I never dare go nigh it, my heart it won't be quiet up the heather glen End of the Heather Glen This recording is in the public domain The Wind Among the Reeds from the Book of Irish Poetry Part one Read for Librivox dot org by Sonia The Wind Among the Reeds by Nora Hopper Mavrone, Mavrone, the wind among the reeds, it calls and cries, and will not let me be, and all its cry is of forgotten deeds, when men were loved of all the dean she. O oh, she that have forgotten how to love, and she that have forgotten how to hate, asleep neath quickened boughs that no winds move, come back to us, ere yet it be too late pipe to us once again lest we forget what piping means till all the silver spears be wild with gusty music such as met carolan once amid the dusty years dance in your rings again the yellow weeds you used to ride so far mount as of old play hide and seek with wind among the reeds and pay your scores again with fairy gold. End of The Wind Among the Reeds. This recording is in the public domain. The Changeling from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. He stood alone outside the fairy hill beneath the horned moon and heard below the grasses gay and shrill an elfin tune there came to him a memory faint and far of things he once had known a square of window and a twinkling star a warm hearthstone he set soft feet upon the turfy path crushing the scented thyme he turned his back upon the fairy wrath the hidden chime he passed the swaying foxgloves by the wall and left the stream behind. A startled rabbit through the brackens tall fled like the wind. Drawn by a baby thought of mother eyes, he pattered down the lane to the low house, and standing tiptoe wise, peeped through the pane. A woman hushed a wakeful child to sleep beside a dying fire. Husho, husho, she crooned, and do not weep, O heart's desire. Lie still and sleep, nor fear the fairy's while. No harm shall come to thee. Outside, her baby saw the changeling smile upon her knee. With dimpled hand, he beat upon the glass. The woman drew the blind. Hush, O oh, my child, dost hear the fairies pass upon the wind. End of the changeling. This recording is in the public domain. The Fairy Lover, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. It was by yonder thorn I saw the fairy host, O low night wind, O wind of the west, my love rode by. There was gold upon his brow, and since that hour I can neither eat nor rest. I dare not pray, lest I should forget his face, O black north wind blowing cold beneath the sky. His face and his eyes shine between me and the sun. If I may not be with him, I would rather die. 
They tell me I am cursed and I will lose my soul, O red wind shrieking o'er the thorn-grown dune. But he is my love, and I go to him tonight. You will ride when the thorn glistens white beneath the moon. You will call my name and lift me to his breast. Blow soft, O oh wind, neath the stars of the south. I care not for heaven, and I fear not hell. If I have but the kisses of his proud red mouth. End of the Fairy Lover. This recording is in the public domain. The Leprechaun or Fairy Shoemaker From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Anita Sloma Martinez Little cowboy, what have you heard Up on the lonely wrath's green mound? Only the plaintive yellow bird Sighing in sultry fields around Cherry, 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 cherry Only the grasshopper and the bee? Tap, rip, rap, tick a tack, too. Scarlet leather sewn together, this will make a shoe. Left, right, pull it tight, summer days are warm. Underground in winter, laughing at the storm. Lay your ear close to the hill. Do you not catch the tiny clamor? Busy click of an elfin hammer. Voice of the leprechaun singing shrill. As he merrily plies his trade, he's a span and a quarter in height. Get him in sight, hold him tight, and you're a made man. You watch your cattle the summer day, sup on potatoes, sleep in the hay. How would you like to roll in your carriage, look for a duchess's daughter in marriage, seize the shoemaker, then you may. Big boots a-hunting, sandals in the hall, white for a wedding feast, pink for a ball. This way, that way, so we make a shoe. Getting rich every stitch, tick tack too. Nine and ninety treasure crocks this keen miser fairy hath, hid in mountains, woods, and rocks, ruin and rantar, cave and wrath, and where the cormorants build. From time of old, guarded by him, each of them filled, full to the brim, with gold. I caught him at work one day myself, in the castle ditch where foxglove grows, a wrinkled, wizened, and bearded elf, spectacles stuck on his pointed nose, silver buckles to his hose, leather apron, shoe in his lap. Rip, rap, tip, tap, tick, tack, too. A grasshopper on my cap, away the moth flew. Buskins for a fairy prince, brogues for his son. Pay me well, pay me well, when the job is done. The rogue was mined beyond a doubt. I stared at him, he stared at me. Servant, sir. Huff, says he, and pulled a snuff-box out. He took a long pinch, looked better pleased, the queer little leprechaun, offered the box with a whimsical grace. Poof, he flung the dust in my face, and while I sneezed, was gone. End of the Leprechaun or Fairy Shoemaker This recording is in the public domain. Fairy Song from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Fairy Song by Eleanor Sweetman When daisies close and poppies nod And meadow grass to earth is laid And fairy stands on moonlit sod Or quaff of dewdrops in the shade Come, gentle dreams, in velvet shod And foot it round each sleeping maid Come softly hither dove-winged flock, and on their pillows make your nest, and light as down from puffball clock, let kisses on their eyes be pressed, then sit upon the couch and rock, each tender little heart to rest. End of Fairy Song This recording is in the public domain. The Others from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Others, by Shames O'Sullivan From our hidden places, by a secret path, we come in the moonlight to the side of the green wrath. Where the night through we take our pleasure, dancing to such a measure 
as earth never knew. To song and dance and lilt without a name, so sweetly breathed, twould put a bird to shame. And many a young maiden is there of mortal birth, her young eyes laden with dreams of earth. And many a youth entranced moves slowly in the wildered round, his brave lost feet enchanted with the rhythm of fairy sound. Music so forest wild and piercing sweet would bring silence on blackbirds singing their best in the ear of spring. And now they pause in their dancing and look with troubled eyes, earth's straying children with sudden memory wise. They pause, and their eyes in the moonlight, with fairy wisdom cold, grow dim, and the thought goes fluttering in the hearts no longer old. And then the dream forsakes them, and sighing they turn anew, as the whispering music takes them to the dance of the elfin crew. Oh, many a thrush and a blackbird would fall to the dewy ground, and pine away in silence for envy of such a sound. So the night through, in our sad pleasure, we dance to many a measure that earth never knew. End of The Others This recording is in the public domain. What is love? From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare, in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. What is love? From the early Irish. A love all commanding, always standing, three a year is my love. A grief darkly hiding, starkly biding, without let or remove. Of strength a sharp straining, past sustaining, Wheresoever I rove, a force still extending without ending, before and around and above. Of heaven tis the brightest amazement, the blackest abasement of hell, a struggle for breath with the scepter, in nectar a choking to death. Tis a race with heaven's lightning and thunder, then champion feats under moils water. Tis pursuing the cuckoo, the wooing of echo, the rock's airy daughter, till my red lips turn ashen, my light limbs grow laden, my heart loses motion, in death my eyes deaden. So is my love and my passion, so is my ceaseless devotion, to her to whom I gave them, to her who will not have them. End of What is Love? This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. The Song of Creed, Daughter of Guer, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. The Song of Creed, Daughter of Guer, translated from a 10th century poem. In the Battle of Adnye, Creed, the daughter of King Guer of Adnye, beheld Dinatach of the High Figenti, who had come to the help of Guer with seventeen wounds upon his breast. Then she fell in love with him. He died and was buried in the cemetery of Colman's church. These are the arrows that murder sleep, At every hour in the night's black deep, Pangs of love through the long day ache, All for the dead Dinatach's sake. Great love of a hero from Roiny's plain Has pierced me through with immortal pain, Blasted my beauty and left me to blanch. A riven bloom on a restless branch. Never was song like Dinatach's speech, But holy strains that to heaven's gate reach, A front of flame without boast or pride, Yet a firm, fond maid for a fair maid's side. A growing girl, I was timid of tongue, And never twisted with gallants young, But since I have won into passionate age, Fierce love longings my heart engage. I have every bounty that life could hold, With Guer, arch monarch of Edne cold, But fallen away from my haughty folk, In ill his field, 
my heart lies broke. There is chanting in glorious Agnes Meadow, under St. Colman's church's shadow, a hero flame sings into the tomb. Dinatar, alas, my love and my doom. Chaste Christ, that now at my life's last breath I should tryst with sorrow and mate with death. At every hour of the night's black deep, these are the arrows that murder sleep. End of The Song of Creed, Daughter of Grail this recording is in the public domain. She by Eleanor Hall From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org The white bloom of the black thorn, she The small sweet raspberry blossom she more fair the shy rare glance of her eye than the wealth of the world to me my heart's pulse my secret she the flower of the fragrant apple she a summer glow o'er the winter's snow twixt christmas and easter she End of She This recording is in the public domain. Creed's Lament for Kale From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Creed's Lament for Kale From the Colloquy of the Ancients Over thy chief, thy rushing chief, Loch Vacon, Loud the haven is roaring. All too late, her deadly hate for Crimthas' son, yonder deep is deploring. Small comfort, I trow, to cree this her wail. Slender solace now, O oh, my kale. Och, own, och, we're us through. Can she who slew bid thee back, spirit soaring? Hark, the thrush from our drum queen lifts his keen through the choir of the thrushes. With his mate, his screaming mate over the green. See, the red weasel rushes. Crushed on the crag lies Glen Seelan's doe. Over her yon stag tells his woe. Thus, Kale, och, och, honey, for thee, for thee my soul's sorrow gushes. O oh, the thrush, the morning thrush, mating shall sing when the first bloom is yellow. O oh, the stag, the grieving stag in the spring with a fresh doe shall fallow. But love for me, neath the ever-moving mound of the scowling sea lieth drowned. While och, och, all agone, the sea-fowl moan and the sea-beasts bellow. End of Creed's Lament for Kale This recording is in the public domain. The Lament of Fund at Parting from Cuchulain From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Lament of Fund at Parting from Cuchulain From the Sickbed of Cuchulain Tis I, who must renounce my love and go, Lest conflict grow between thyself and me. Yet had I shared with thee Cuchulain's love, my joy had been above all jealousy. Nay, happier were it here for me to dwell, Submitting well to thy supremacy, Than thus depart unto my royal seat Of Art Abrat, strange though the thought to thee. The man is thine, Emmer, in this love strife, O noble wife, from me he breaks away, Yet none the less I hunger for the bliss I now shall miss and miss and miss all away proud prince on prince has supplicated me in secrecy his passion's joy to share with none of these have i a love tryst kept but still have stepped stern-minded past the snare joyless is she who gives a heart's whole meed 
to him who no full heed thereto returns better for her indeed in death to pass than not be yearned for as for him she yearns with fifty women dost thou hither fare thou of the lustrous hair and lofty will for fans overthrow with all their tongues of scorn is well thy rival love forlorn to kill three times of fifty women such as these attend my ease wise marriageable fair they wait me now within my royal brow with pity stew to calm my cruel care end of the lament of fund at parting from kuholm this recording is in the public domain Were You on the Mountain? From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org. Were You on the Mountain? By Douglas Hyde. Oh, were you on the mountain? Or saw you my love? Or saw you my own one, my queen and my dove? Or saw you the maiden, with a step firm and free? And say, is she pining in sorrow like me? I was upon the mountain. And I saw there your love. I saw there your own one, your queen and your dove. I saw there the maiden with the step firm and free, and she was not pining in sorrow like thee. End of Were You on the Mountain? This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stefan D'Souza. Pulse of My Heart from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Pulse of My Heart As the sweet blackberry's modest bloom Fair flowering greets the sight Or strawberries in their rich perfume Fragrance and bloom unite So this fair plant of tender youth In outward charms can vie and from within the soul of truth Soft beaming fills her eye Pulse of my heart Dear source of care Stolen sighs and love-breathed vows Sweeter than when through scented air Gay bloom the apple boughs With thee no day can winter seem Nor frost nor blast can chill Thou the soft breeze the cheering beam that keeps its summer still. Charlotte Brook End of Pulse of My Heart This recording is in the public domain. Two Songs from the Irish From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Two Songs from the Irish one. The stars stand up in the air. The sun and the moon are gone. The strand of its waters is bare, and her sway is swept from the swan. The cuckoo was calling all day, hid in the branches above. How my storing is fled far away. Tis my grief that I gave her my love. Three things through love I see. Sorrow and sin and death. And my mind reminding me that these do my breathe with my breath. But sweeter than violin or lute is my love, and she left me behind. I wish that all music were mute, and I to all beauty were blind. She's more shapely than swan by the strand. She's more radiant than grass after dew. She's more fair than the stars where they stand. Tis my grief that her ever I knew. End of two songs from the Irish. One, this recording is in a public domain. Two songs from the Irish. Two, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org. Two songs from the Irish. Two. Tis a pity I'm not in England, or with one from Erin, thither bound. Or out in the midst of the ocean, where the thousands of ships are drowned. From wave to wave of the ocean, 
to be guided on with the wind and the rain, and O King, that thou mightst guide me back to my love again. End of two songs from the Irish, two. This recording is in the public domain. Pearl of the White Breast From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Pearl of the White Breast by George Petrie From the Irish There's a colin fair as may For a year and for a day I've sought by every way her heart to gain There's no art of tongue or eye Fond youth with maidens try But I've tried with ceaseless sigh Yet tried in vain if to France or far off Spain she'd cross the watery main, To see her face again the sea I'd brave, And if this heaven's decree that mine she may not be, May the son of Mary me in mercy save. O oh, thou blooming milk-white dove, To whom I've given true love, Do not ever thus reprove my constancy. There are maidens would be mine, With wealth in hand and kind, if my heart would but incline to turn from thee. But the kiss with welcome bland, and the touch of thy dear hand, are all that I demand, wouldst thou not spurn. For if not mine, dear girl, O snowy-breasted pearl, may I never from the fair with life return. End of Pearl of the White Breast This recording is in the public domain. The Outlaw of Loch Lean, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Outlaw of Loch Lean by Jeremiah Joseph Callanan, from the Irish. Oh, many a day have I made good ale in the glen that came not of stream or malt, like the brewing of men. My bed was the ground, my roof the greenwood above, and the wealth that I sought. One far kind glance from my love. Alas, on that night when the horses I drove from the field, That I was not near from terror my angel to shield. She stretched forth her arms, her mantle she flung to the wind, And swam over Loch Lean, her outlawed lover to find. Oh, would that a freezing sleet-winged tempest did sweep, And I and my love were alone far off on the deep. I'd ask not a ship or a bark or pinnace to save. With her hand round my waist, I'd fear not the wind or the wave. Tis down by the lake, where the wild tree fringes its sides, The maid of my heart, my fair one of heaven, resides. I think as at eve she wanders its mazes along, The birds go to sleep by the sweet wild twist of her song. End of The Outlaw of Loch Lean. This recording is in the public domain. Sean Du Deelish From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Sean Du Deelish By Sir Samuel Ferguson From the Irish Put your head, darling, 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 your darling black head, my heart above. O mouth of honey, with the time for fragrance, Who with heart in breast could deny you love? O many and many a young girl for me is pining, Letting her locks of gold to the cold wind free, For me, the foremost of our gay young fellows, But I'd leave a hundred pure love for thee. Then put your head, Darling, 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 your darling black head, my heart above. O oh, mouth of honey, with the time for fragrance, who with heart in breast could deny you love? End of Sean Du Deelish. This recording is in the public domain. The Flower of Nut Brown Maids by Eleanor Hull. From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. 
from the seventeenth century irish if thou wilt come with me to the county of leitrim flower of nut-brown maids honey of bees and me to the beaker's brim i'll offer thee nut-brown maid where the pure air floats o'er the swinging boats of the strand under the white-topped wave that laves the edge of the sand there without fear we will wander together hand clasped in hand flower of nut-brown maids my heart never gave you liking or love said the flower of nut-brown maids though sweet are your words there's black famine above said the flower of nut-brown maids with gentle words feed me when need and grim hunger come by better be free than with thee to the woodlands to fly what gain to us both if together we famish and die wept the flower of nut-brown maids i saw her coming towards me o'er the face of the mountain like a star glimmering through the mist in the field of firs where the slow cows were browsing in pledge of our love we kissed in the bend of the hedge where the tall trees play with the sun i wrote her the lines that should bind us for ever in one had you a right to deny me the dues i had won o flower of nut-brown maids my grief and my torment that thou art not here with me now flower of nut-brown maids alone all alone it matters not where or how o flower of nut-brown maids on a slender bed o little black head strained close to thee or a heap of hay until break of day it were one to me laughing in gladness and glee together with none to see my flower of nut-brown maids end of the nut-brown maids this recording is in the public domain pastine finn by sir samuel ferguson from the book of irish poetry part one read for LibriVox.org. recording by elaine conway england from the irish oh my fair pastine is my heart's delight her gay heart loves in her blue eye bright like the apple blossom her bosom white and her neck like the swans on a march morn bright chorus then oro come with me come with me come with me oro come with me brown girl sweet and oh i would go through snow and sleet if you would come with me brown girl sweet love of my heart my fair past heen her cheeks are red as the roses sheen but my lips have tasted no more i ween then the glass i drink to the health of my queen were i in the town where's mirth and glee or twixt two barrels of barley brie with my fair past heen upon my knee tis i would drink to her pleasantly nine nights i lay in longing and pain betwixt two bushes beneath the rain thinking to see you love again but whistle and call were all in vain i'll leave my people both friend and foe from all the girls in the world i'll go but from you sweetheart oh never oh no till i die in the coffin stretched cold and low end of past heen finn this recording is in the public domain she is my love by douglas hyde from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england from the irish she is my love beyond all thought though she has wrought my deepest dole yet dearer for the cruel pain than one who fain would make me whole she is my glittering gem of gems who yet contemns my fortune bright whose cheek but glows with redder scorn since mine has worn a stricken white she is my sun and moon and star who yet so far and cold doth keep 
she would not even oh my bier one tender tear of pity weep into my heart unsought she came a wasting flame a haunting care into my heart of hearts ah why and left to sigh for ever there end of she is my love this recording is in the public domain happy tis thou blind for thee by douglas hyde from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england happy tis thou blind for thee that thou seest not our star couldst thou see but as we see her thou wouldst be but as we are once i pitied sightless men i was then unscathed by sight now i envy those who see not they can be not hurt by light woe who once has seen her please and then sees her not each hour woe for him her love mesh binding whose unwinding passes power end of happy tis thou blind for thee this recording is in the public domain the coolen by sir samuel ferguson from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england from the irish oh had you seen the coolen walking down by the cuckoo street with the dew of the meadow shining on her milk-white twinkling feet oh my love she is and my colleen oak and she dwells in balnagar and she bears the palm of beauty bright on the fairest that in erin are in balnagar is the cool un, like the berry on the bough of her cheek bright beauty dwells for ever on her neck and ringlets sleek oh sweeter is her mouth's soft music than the lark or thrush at dawn or the blackbird in the green wood singing farewell to the setting sun rise up my boy bake ready to horse for i forth would ride to follow the modest damsel where she walks on the green hillside for ever since our youth were we plighted in faith truth and wedlock true oh sweeter her voice is nine times over than organ or cuckoo and ever since my childhood i've loved the fair and darling child but our people came between us and with lucre our pure love defiled oh my woe it is and my bitter pain and i weep it night and day that the colleen born of my early love is torn from my heart away end of the colon this recording is in the public domain Irish Love Song by Catherine Tynan Hinkson From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England From the Irish Would God I were that tender apple blossom Floating and falling from the twisted bough To lie and faint within your silken bosom As that does now or would i were a little burnished apple for you to pluck me gliding by so cold while sun and shade your robe of lawn will dapple your hair spun gold yea would to god i were among the roses that lean to kiss you as you float between while on the lowest branch a bud encloses to touch you queen nay since you will not love would i were growing a happy daisy in the garden path that so your silver foot might press me going even unto death end of irish love song this recording is in the public domain cashel of munster by edward walsh from the book of irish poetry part one Read for LibriVox.org 
Recording by Elaine Conway, England, from the Irish. I would wear to you, dear, without gold or gear, or counted kine. My wealth you'll be, would fair friends agree, and you be mine. My grief, my gloom, that you do not come. My heart's dear poured, to cash out fair, though our couch were there, but a hard deal bored. O oh, come, my bride, o oh, the wild hillside to the valley low, a downy bed for my love I'll spread where waters flow, and we shall stray where streamlets play, the groves among where echo tells to the listening dells the blackbird's song, love tender, true, I gave to you, and secret sighs in hope to see upon you and me one hour arise. Where the priest's blessed voice would bind my choice into the ring's strict tie. If wife you be, love to one but me, love in grief I'll die. A neck of white has my heart's delight, and breast like snow, and flowing hair, whose ringlets fair to the green grass flow. Alas, that I did not early die, before the day that saw me here, from my bosoms, dear, far, far away. End of Cashel of Munster. This recording is in the public domain. Molly Asthor by George Ogle from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England As down by Banner's banks I strayed, one evening in May, The little birds with blithest notes made vocal every spray. They sung their little notes of love, they sang them o'er and o'er. Ah, grandma Cree, ma Colleen Oak, ma Molly, Asthor, The days is pied and all the sweets the dawn of nature yields. The primrose pale, the violet blue, lay scattered o'er the fields. Such fragrance in the bosom lies of her whom I adore. Ah, grandma Cree, ma Colin Oak, ma Molly as Thor. I laid me down upon the bank, bewailing my sad fate that doomed me thus, the slave of love and cruel Molly's hate. How can she break the honest heart? That wears her in its core. O oh, grandma Cree, ma Colleen Oak, ma Molly as Thor. He said you loved me, Molly dear. Ah, oh, why did I believe? Yet who could think such tender words were meant but to deceive? That love was all I asked on earth. Nay, heaven could give no more. Ah, oh, grandma Cree, ma Colleen Oak, ma Molly as Thor. Oh, had I all the flocks that graze on yonder yellow hill, or load for me the numerous herds that yon green pastures fill, with her I'd gladly share my kine, with her my fleecy stall. Ah, grandma cree, ma colleen oak, ma molly as thaw. Two turtle doves above my head sat courting on a bow. I envied them their happiness to see them bill and coo. Such fondness once for me she showed, but now, alas, tis o'er. Oh. Ah, grandma Cree, ma Colleen Oak, ma Molly, as thaw. Then fare thee well, my Molly dear, thy loss I e'er shall moan. While life remains in Strephon's heart, it beats for thee alone. Though thou art false, may heaven on thee its choicest blessings pour. Ah, grandma Cree, ma Colleen Oak. Me Molly as Thor. End of Molly as Thor. This recording is in the public domain. Remembrance by Emily Bronte from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Cold in the earth, in the deep snow above thee, far, far removed, cold in the dreary grave, have I forgot 
my only love, to love thee, severed at last by time's all-severing wave? Now, when alone, do my thoughts no longer hover over the mountains on that northern shore, resting their wings where heath and fern leaves cover thy noble heart for ever, ever more? Cold in the earth, and fifteen wild Decembers, from these brown hills have melted into spring. Faithful, indeed, is this spirit that remembers, after such years of change and suffering. Sweet love of youth, forgive if I forget thee, while the world's tide is bearing me along. Other desires and other hopes beset me, hopes which obscure but cannot do thee wrong. No later light has lighted up my heaven, no second morn has ever shone for me. All my life's bliss from thy dear life was given, all my life's bliss is in the grave with thee. But when the days of golden dreams had perished, and even despair was powerless to destroy, then did I learn how existence could be cherished, strengthened and fed without the aid of joy. Then did I check the tears of useless passion, weaned my young soul from yearning after thine, sternly denied its burning wish to hasten down to that tomb already more than mine. And even yet I dare not let it languish, dare not indulge in memory's rapturous pain, once drinking deep of that divinest anguish how could i seek the empty world again end of remembrance this recording is in the public domain lament of the irish maiden from the book of irish poetry part 1 read for librivox.org by sonia lament of the irish maiden by denny lane on Carrick Dune, the heath is brown, the clouds are dark over Ardner Lee, and many a stream comes rushing down to swell the angry owner bee. The moaning blast is sweeping fast through many a leafless tree, and I'm alone, for he is gone, my hawk has flown, a hone Macree. The heath was green on Carrick Dune, bright shone the sun on Ardner Lee. The dark green trees bend trembling down to kiss the slumbering Aunabvi. That happy day, twas but last May, tis like a dream to me, when Donald swore I over and o'er we'd part no more a storm Macree. Soft April showers and bright May flowers will bring the summer back again, but will they bring me back the hours I spent with my brave Donald then? Tis but a chance for he's gone to france to wear the fleur de lis but i'll follow you my donald do for still i'm true to you macri end of lament of the irish maiden this recording is in the public domain the desmond from the book of irish poetry part 1 read for librivox.org recording by kudna by the fields we've been eyed, no star in the skies. To thy door by love lighted, I first saw those eyes. Some voice whispered unto me, as the threshold I crossed, there was ruin before me. If I left, I was lost. Love came and brought sorrow, too soon in his train. It's so sweet that tomorrow we're welcome again. No misers full measure my portion should be, I would drain it with pleasure. If poured out by thee. You who call this honor to bow to this flame, if you eyes look upon her and blush while you blame. Had the pearl lost whiteness because of its birth? Had the violet lost brightness for growing near earth? No, man for his glory the ancestry flies, but woman's bright story is still in her eyes. While the monarch but traces through mortals his line, beauty born of the graces ranks next to divine. End of the Desmond. This recording is in the public domain.
Love Song from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare, County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the province of Ulster. Love Song, sweet in her green dale, the flower of beauty slumbers, lulled by the faint breezes sighing through her hair. Sleeps she and hears not the melancholy numbers, breathed to my sad lit mid the lonely air. Down from the high cliffs the rivulet is teeming To wind round the willow banks that lure him from above. O oh, that in tears from my rocky prison streaming, I too could glide to the bower of my love. Ah, where the woodbines, with sleepy arms, have wind her, Opes she her eyelids in the dream of my lay, Listening like the dove, while the fountains echo round her, To her lost mate's call in the forests far away. Come then, my bird, for the peace thou ever bearest, still heaven's messenger of comfort to me. Come, this fond bosom, O faithfulest and fairest, bleeds with its death wound, its wounds of love for thee. George Darley. End of Love Song. This recording is in the public domain. If I Had Thought Thou Couldst Have Died by Charles Wolfe. From The Book of Irish Poetry. Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org If I had thought thou couldst have died, I might not weep for thee, But I forgot, when by thy side, That thou couldst mortal be. It never through my mind had passed, The time would ever be o'er, And I on thee should look my last, And thou shalt smile no more. And still upon that face I look, And think it will smile again, and still the thought I will not brook, that I must look in vain. But when I speak thou dost not say, what thou never left unsaid. And now I feel as well I may, sweet Mary, thou art dead. If thou wouldst stay even as thou art, all cold and all serene, if I might press thy silent heart, and where thy smiles have been, while even thy chill bleak course I have, Thou seemest still mine own, but there I lay thee in thy grave, and I am now alone. I do not think wherever thou art, thou hast forgotten me, and I perhaps may soothe this heart by thinking too of thee. Yet there was round thee such a dawn of light never seen before, as fancy never could have drawn, and never can restore. End of if I had thought thou couldst have died by Charles Wolfe, this recording is in the public domain. A White Rose from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org The red rose whispers of passion, and the white rose breathes of love. Oh, the red rose is a falcon, and the white rose is a dove. But I send you a cream-white rosebud, with a flush on its petal tips, for the love that is purest and sweetest has a kiss of desire on the lips. End of a white rose. This recording is in the public domain. Kitty Neal from the book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. Ah, sweet Kitty Neal, rise up from that wheel. Your neat little foot will be weary from spinning. Come trip down with me to the sycamore tree. Half the parish is there, and the dance is beginning. The sun has gone down, but the full harvest moon shines sweetly and cool in the dew-whitened valley, while all the air rings with the soft loving things. Each little bird sings in the green-shaded alley. With a blush and a smile, Kitty rose up the while, her eyes in the glass, as she bound her hair glancing, "'Tis hard to refuse when a young lover sues, "'so she couldn't but choose to go off to the dancing. "'And now on the green the glad groups are seen, "'each gay-hearted lad with the last of his choosing. "'And Pat, without fail, leads out sweet Kitty Neal. "'Somehow when he asked, she ne'er thought of refusing. "'Now Felix McGee puts his pipes to his knee, "'and with flourish so free sets each couple in motion. "'With a cheer and a bound the lads patter the ground.' The maids move around just like swans on the ocean. Cheeks bright as the rose, 
feet light as the does, now coyly retiring, now boldly advancing. Search the world all round, from the sky to the ground. No such sight can be found as an Irish last dancing. Sweet Kate, who could view your bright eyes of deep blue, beaming humidly through their dark lashes so mildly, your fair-turned arm heaving breast-rounded form, nor feel his warm heart and his pulses throb wildly? Young Pat feels his heart as he gazes depart, subdued by the smart of such painful yet sweet love. The sight leaves his eyes as he says with a sigh, Dance light for my heart, it lies under your feet, love. End of Kitty Neal. This recording is in the public domain. Kathleen O'More from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. My love, still I think that I see her once more, but alas, she has left me her loss to deplore. My own little Kathleen, my poor little Kathleen, my Kathleen no more. Her hair glossy black, her eyes were dark blue, her color still changing, her smiles ever new. So pretty was Kathleen, my sweet little Kathleen, my Kathleen no more. She milked the dun cow that ne'er offered to stir, though wicked to all it was gentle to her. So kind was my Kathleen, my poor little Kathleen, my Kathleen no more. She sat at the door one cold afternoon to hear the wind blow and to gaze on the moon. So pensive was Kathleen, my poor little Kathleen, my Kathleen no more. Cold was the night breeze that sighed round her bower. It chilled my poor Kathleen. She drooped from that hour. And I lost my poor Kathleen, my own little Kathleen, my Kathleen no more. The bird of all birds that I love the best is the robin that in the churchyard builds his nest. For he seems to watch Kathleen, hops lightly o'er Kathleen, my Kathleen O'More. End of Kathleen O'More. This recording is in the public domain. The Boatman of Kinsale From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org His kiss is sweet, his word is kind, his love is rich to me. I could not in a palace find a truer love than he. The eagle shelters not his nest from hurricane and hail. More bravely than he guards my breast, the boatman of Kinsale. The wind that round the fast net sweeps is not a whit more pure. The goat that knocked down shay he leaps has not a foot more sure. No firmer hand, no freer eye, ere face an autumn gale. De Courcy's heart is not so high, the boatman of Kinsale. The brawling squires may heed him not, the dainty stranger sneer. But who will dare to hurt our cot when Miles O'Hay is here? His hookers in the skilly van, when sains are in the foam. But money never made the man, nor wealth a happy home. So blessed with love and liberty, while he can trim a sail, he'll trust in God and cling to me, the boatman of Kinsale. End of The Boatman of Kinsale. This recording is in the public domain. Many from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Kudrna. O oh, crystal bell, play dainty on golden sands, when she comes at morning lonely, followed by her shadow only, to bear those little slender hands. All of you gathering, cease to make her bluebird sing. O oh, crystal well. O oh, forest brown, read Irish's twilight balm. As she wanders, pulling willow, leafless for her fragrant pillow, which with snowy cheek and calm, she shall press with half-closed eyes, while the great stars o'er thee rise. O oh, forest brown. O oh, lady moon, light her as she mounts the stair, to her little sacred chamber, like a mother, and remember, while she slumbers full of prayer, sweetly then to fill her heart, with dreams of heaven, where thou art, O Lady Moon. End of Minnie. This recording is in the public domain. Song 1 from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. Song 1 by Aubrey de Vere. Slanting both hands against her forehead, 
On me she leveled her bright eyes. My whole heart brightened as the sea. When midnight clouds part suddenly, through all my spirit went the luster, like starlight poured through purple skies. And then she sang aloud, sweet music, yet louder as aloft it clomb. Soft when her curving lips it left, then rising till the heavens were cleft, as though each strain on high expanding were echoes in a silver dome. But ah, she sings she does not love me, she loves to say she ne'er can love. To me her beauty she denies, bending the while on me those eyes, whose beams might charm the mountain leopard, or lure Jove's herald from above. End of Song 1. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stefan D'Souza. Song 2 from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org. Song 2 by Aubrey de Vere. She says, Poor friend, you waste a treasure which you can ne'er regain. Time, health, and glory for the pleasure of toying with a chain. But then her voice so tender grows, so kind and so caressing. Each murmur from her lips that flows comes to me like a blessing. Sometimes she says, Sweet friend, I grieve you. Alas, it gives me pain. What can I, ah, might I relieve you? You ne'er had mourned in vain. And then her little hand she presses upon her heart and sighs. While tears, whose source not yet she guesses, Grow larger in her eyes. End of Song 2. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stefan D'Souza. An Ancient Tale from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org. An Ancient Tale by John O'Hagan. He leaned upon the garden gate. He looked, and scarce he breathed. Within the little porch she safe, with woodbine overreathed. Her eyes upon her work were bent, unconscious who was nigh. But oft the needle slowly went, and oft did idle lie. And ever to her lips arose sweet fragments sweetly sung. But ever, ere the notes could close, she hushed them on her tongue. Long, long the sun had sunken down and all his golden trail had died away to lines of brown in duskier hues that fail. The grasshopper was chirping still. No other living sound accompanied the tiny rill that gurgled underground. No other living sound unless some spirit bent to hear low words of human tenderness and mingling whispers near. The stars like pallid gems at first, deep in the liquid sky. Now forth upon the darkness burst, soul kings and lights on high, for splendor, myriadfold, supreme. No rival moorlight strove, nor lovelier e'er was Hesper's beam, not more majestic Jove. But what if hearts there beat that night, that recked not at the skies, or only felt their image light in one another's eyes. And if two worlds of hidden thought and fostered passion met, which, passing human language, sought and found an utterance yet, and if they trembled as the stars that droop across the stream, the while the silent starry hours wait o'er them like a dream, and if, when came the parting time, they faltered still and clung, what is it all, an ancient rhyme, ten thousand times resun? That part of paradise which man, without the portal knows, which hath been since the world began, and shall be till its close. End of An Ancient Tale This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stefan D'Souza Donald Kenny by John Keegan Casey From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 
Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Come, Piper, play the Shaskan reel, or else the lasses on the heather at Mary lay aside your wheel until we dance once more together at fair and pattern oft before of reels and jigs we've tripped full many but ne'er again this loved old floor will feel the foot of donald kenny softly she rose and took his hand and softly glided through the measure while clustering round the village band looked half in sorrow half in pleasure warm blessings flowed from every lip as ceased the dancer's airy motion oh blessed virgin guide the ship which bears bold donnell o'er the ocean now god be with you all he sighed adown his face the bright tears flowing god guard you well a vic they cried upon the strange path you are going so full his breast he scarce could speak with burning grasp the stretched hands taking he pressed a kiss on every cheek and sobbed as if his heart was breaking boys don't forget me when i'm gone for sake of all that days passed over the days you spent on heath and bourne with donal ruda the rattling rover mary agra your soft brown eye has willed my fate he whispered lowly another holds thy heart good-bye heaven grant you both its blessings holy a kiss upon her brow of snow a rush across the moonlit meadow whose broom clad hazels trembling slow the mossy boreen wrapped in shadow away o'er tully's bounding grill and far beyond the inny river one cheer on carrick's rocky hill and donald kenny's gone for ever End of Donald Kenny. This recording is in the public domain. The Dry Nan Dune by Robert Dwyer Joyce. From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. By road and by river, the wild birds sing, O'er mountain and valley, the dewy leaves spring, The gay flowers are shining, gilt o'er by the sun, And fairest of all shines the dry dun, The wrath of the fairy, the ruin hoar, With white silver splendour, it decks them all o'er, And down in the valleys, where merry streams run, How sweet smile the blossoms of the dry dun ah well i remember the soft spring day i sat by my love neath its sweet scented spray the day that she told me her heart i had won beneath the white blossoms of the dry dun the streams they were singing their gladsome song the soft winds were blowing the wild woods among the mountains shone bright in the red setting sun as we sat neath the blossoms of the dry nundun tis my prayer in the morning my dream at night to sit thus again by my heart's dear delight with her blue eyes of gladness her hair like the sun and her bright pleasant smile neath the dry nundun end of the dry nundun this recording is in the public domain wild geese by rosa mulholland from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england i had to sail across the sea a brave white bird went forth for me my heart was hid beneath his wing a strong white bird come back in spring I watched the wild geese rise and cry across the flaming western sky. Their winnowing pinions clove the light, then vanished and came down the night. I laid me low, my day was done. I longed not for the morrow's sun, but closely swathed in swoon of sleep, forgot to hope, forgot to weep. 
the moon through veils of gloomy red a warm yet dusky radiance shed all down our valley's golden stream and flushed my slumber with a dream her mystic torch lit up my brain my spirit rose and lived again and followed through the windy spray that bird upon its watery way a wild white bird a wail for me my soul hath wings to fly with thee on foam waves lengthening out afar will ride toward the western star o oh, glimmering plains through forest gloam to track a wanderer's feet i come mid lonely swamp by haunted brake i'll pass unfrightened for his sake alone afar his footsteps roam the stars his roof the tent his home sawest thou what way the wild geese flew to sunward through the thick night dew carry my soul where he abides and pierce the mystery that hides his presence and through time and space look with mine eyes upon his face beside his prairie fire he rests all feathered things are in their nests what strange wild bird is this he saith still fragrant with the ocean's breath perch on my hand that briny thing and let me stroke thy shy wet wing what message in thy soft eye thrills i see again my native hills and vale and river's silver streak the mist upon the blue blue peak the shadows grey the golden sheaves the mossy walls the russet eaves i greet the friends i've loved and lost do all forget no tempest tossed that braved for me the ocean's foam some heart remembers me at home ere springs return i will be there that strange sea fragrant messenger i wake and weep the moon shines sweet o oh, dream too short o oh, bird too fleet end of the wild geese this recording is in the public domain Outside by Francis Wynne from the Book of Irish Poetry Part One, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. Outside, a shining pathway of light slopes down from the half-closed door. Through the darkness on either hand, it glimmers golden and wide. A fair bridge spanning the night, and the dread desolation o'er, stretching to me where I stand, forgotten, forlorn outside. If I dare to turn my feet away from the chill and the gloom, if I followed yon radiant track, with eager and noiseless tread, should I find her, my only sweet, in some fragrant, fire-lit room, her soft dress, shadowy black, and the glow on her bent bright head? Perhaps if I only dread, she would not bid me be gone. Perhaps she would smile as of yore, and be kind and forget to chide. Perhaps if she knew how I cared, I will go, I will seek her anon. Alas, they have shut the door, and I am alone outside. Francis Wine End of Outside This recording is in the public domain. To an Isle in the Water By William Butler Yeats From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Shy one, shy one, shy one of my heart, She moves in the firelight, pensively apart, She carries in the dishes, and lays them in a row, To an isle in the water, with her I would go, she carries in the candles and lights the curtained room shy in the doorway and shy in the gloom and shy as a rabbit helpful and shy to an isle in the water with her would i fly end of 
to an isle in the water. This recording is in the public domain. An old song resung by William Butler Yeats from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. An old song resung. Down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet. She passed the Sally Gardens with little snow-white feet. She bid me take love easy as the leaves grow on the tree, but I, being young and foolish, with her would not agree. In a field by the river my love and I did stand, and on my leaning shoulder she laid her snow-white hand. She bid me take life easy as the grass grows on the weirs, but I was young and foolish, and now am full of tears. End of an old song resung by William Butler Yeats. This recording is in the public domain. Killery by Herbert Trench From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England when all her brothers in the house were lying asleep my love ran before me under the bend of boughs till we looked down from above on the long loch on the broven loch on the lone loch of killery together we ran down the copse and stood in the rain as close as the birds that sleep in the soft tops of the tree that comes and goes when the morn moon when the young moon and the morn moon is on killery in tremblings of the water chill swans we saw preen their coat biting their plumes with stooped bill and quivering neck afloat on the brown shade on the deep shade the shade of hills on killery why pale my beloved now with the first light gins to beat no sun of autumn is rich as thou and honey after thy feet shall rise from the grass from the wet of the grass the brow of the grass over killery my grief it is only that thou and i must part like swans of the flood that rise up sorrowful into the sky for one goes over the wood and one over sea from killery p ah the little raindrops that hang on the bough together they may run but never again shall I and thou meet here in the morning sun. We shall meet no more, we must kiss no more, we shall meet no more by Killery. End of Killery. This recording is in the public domain. The Wood Pigeon by Catherine Tynan From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The Wood Pigeon. The skies were laden, the snowflakes were falling, no blackbird or linnet was courting or calling, but the wood dove's sweet moaning was heard in the distance, and her song all of love came in dulcet persistence. Oh, what though the nests were all flooded with water, and the cold eggs would give them no sweet son or daughter, she was dreamy with pleasure for her true love beside her and her day was as gold as though young leaves did hide her. O oh, love, sang the wood dove, the sweet bird of summer. It were death, it were madness, were my love a roamer. But love, true and faithful, what power has cold weather to still our wild song's love, since we are together? Then I said to my true love, true love is enough, love, and how wise is the wood dove who learns that lore off, love this our charm for the winter and when the winds cry love and when in the grave on your heart i still lie love end of the wood pigeon by katherine tynan this recording is in the public domain forgiveness by a e from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org by larry wilson Forgiveness. At dusk the window panes grew gray, the wet world vanished in the gloom, the dim and silver end of day scarce glimmered through the little room. 
and all my sins were told. I said such things to her who knew not sin, the sharp ache throbbing in my head, the fever running high within. I touched with pain her purity, sin's darker sense I could not bring. My soul was black as night to me. To her I was a wounded thing. I needed love no words could say. She drew me softly nigh her chair, my head upon her knees to lay, with cool hands that caressed my hair. She sat with hands as if to bless, and looked with grave ethereal eyes, ensouled with ancient quietness, a gentle priestess of the wise. End of Forgiveness by A. E. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Arthur O'Shaughnessy From the Book of Irish Poetry, Volume 1 Recording by Larry Wilson I made another garden, yea, for my new love. I left the dead rose where it lay, and set the new above. Why did the summer not begin? Why did my heart not haste? My old love came and walked therein, and laid the garden waste. She entered with her weary smile, just as of old. She looked around a little while, and shivered at the cold. Her passing touch was death to all, her passing look a blight. She made the white rose petals fall, and turned the red rose white. Her pale robe, clinging to the grass, seemed like a snake, that bit the grass and ground, alas, and a sad trail did make. She went up slowly to the gate, and there, just as of yore, she turned back at the last to wait, and say farewell once more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nature and Love by Stopford A. Brook From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson nature and love when first i gave him all my love i took the beauty of the world wild winds and sunlight stars above and clouds upon the mountains furled the life of waters and of woods the sweetness of the flowers and grass dreams of the sunset joyous moods the spirit of the summer has i filled him with their soft romance i set my heart within its shrine he saw the lovely countenance of nature, and then turned to mine. All, all I loved was given to him. All, all I loved was shown to me. And then that evening gray and dim, the low moon burning o'er the sea. He kissed me. I gave back his kiss. My arms were round him, warm and fast. Is nature more, I cried, than this? Have I not conquered her at last? Since then he has loved, and loved so much, that in the grave men say asleep, he shall not lose my sweet wild touch through all the silence of the deep. But when the immortal passions move, shall quick rise, and with a cry, run to my arms and say, O oh, love thou hast not forgotten, no, nor I. End of Nature and Love by Stopford A. Brook this recording is in the public domain. The Little Flutes by Mrs. Dennis O'Sullivan From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England The world has slipped away and gone Like rain into the sea what could be calling me? For songs and silver flutes are gone, The little flutes he fluted on, That will not leave me be. These northern mountains in their pride Are stepping from the sea, I mind he loved the sea, Blue lovely towers, bald in pride. I wonder now, is peace inside? Would sorrow leave me be? For in his speech you knew the south, and in his eyes the sea, the grey, green, changing sea, O oh, islands sweeter in the south, and sweet the speaking of his mouth, that will not leave me be. 
I mind his whistles through the dark, the tunes he piped for me, the flutes he fluted free. Faint sounding as a soaring lark, soft sounding, silver flutes at dark that will not leave me be. He's surely walking in the west and piping to the sea of Ireland, Ireland free. In Cork or Kerry, south or west, O oh, grief of Ireland, that he rest, and leave the pipe in be. He's put the small flute to his mouth. The flute, the flute, and calls to me. Past Wicklow Hills, I see his laughing eyes, that loved the south, his silver pipes that call me south, and will not leave me be. End of the Little Flutes This recording is in the public domain. The Penalty of Love by Sidney Roy Slysart From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org If love should count you worthy And should deign one day to seek your door And be your guest Pause ere you draw the bolt and give him rest If in your old content you would remain for not alone he enters. In his train are angels of the mist, the lonely quest, dreams of the unfulfilled and unpossessed, and sorrow, and life's immemorial pain. He wakes desires you never may forget. He shows you stars you never saw before. He makes you share with him forevermore The burden of the world's divine regret. How wise were you to open not! And yet, how poor if you should turn him from the door! End of the Penalty of Love To Morfid by Lionel Johnson From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway England A voice on the winds A voice on the waters Wanders and cries Oh, what are the winds And what are the waters Mine are your eyes West and the winds West and the winds are and west in the waters, where the light lies. Oh, what are the winds? And what are the waters? Mine or your eyes? Cold, cold grow the winds, and dark grow the waters, where the sun dies. Oh, what are the winds? And what are the waters? Mine or your eyes? And down the night winds, and down the night waters, the music flies. Oh, what are the winds? And what are the waters? Cold be the winds, and wild be the waters, so mine be your eyes. End of To Morphid. This recording is in the public domain. The Sedges by Seamus O'Sullivan. From the Book of Irish Poetry, Volume 1. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. I whispered my great sorrow to every listening sedge, And they bent, bowed with my sorrow, down to the water's edge. But she stands and laughs lightly to see me sorrow so, Like the light winds that laughing across the water go. If I could tell the bright ones that quiet-hearted move, They would bend down like the sedges with the sorrow of love. But she stands laughing lightly, who all my sorrow knows, like the little wind that laughing across the water blows. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Can do dealish from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Can do dealish by Dora Sigerson. 
can do dealish beside the sea i stand and stretch my hands to thee across the world the riderless horses race to shore with thundering hoofs and shuddering hoar blown manes uncurled can do dealish i cry to thee beyond the world beneath the sea thou being dead where hast thou hidden from the beat of crushing hoofs and tearing feet thy dear black head god bless the woman whoever she be from the tossing waves will recover thee and lashing wind who will take thee out of the wind and storm dry thy wet face on her bosom warm and lips so kind i not to know it is hard to pray but i shall for this woman from day to day comfort my dead the sports of the winds and the play of the sea i love thee too well for this thing to be o oh, dear black head end of can do dealish this recording is in the public domain the betrayal from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org Recording by Anita Sloma Martinez When you were weary, roaming the wide world over, I gave my fickle heart to a new lover. Now they tell me that you are lying dead. O oh, mountains fall on me and hide my head. When you lay burning in the throes of fever, He vowed me love by the willow-margined river. Death smote you there, here was your trust betrayed. O oh, darkness, cover me, I am afraid. Yea, in the hour of your supremest trial, I laughed with him. The shadow on the dial stayed not, aghast at my dread ignorance, nor man nor angel looked at me askance. Under the mountains there is peace abiding, darkness shall be pavilion for my hiding, tears shall blot out the sin of broken faith, the lips that falsely kiss shall kiss but death. End of The Betrayal This recording is in the public domain. Song by Eleanor Alexander From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org he climbs his lady's tower, Where sail cold clouds about the moon, And at his feet the nightingale sings, Sir, too soon, too soon. He steals across his lady's park, He tries her secret gate, And overhead the saucy lark sings, Sir, too late, too late. End of song. This recording is in the public domain. A Silent Mouth From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia A Silent Mouth by Cathal O'Brien O oh, little green leaf on the bough, you hear the lark in the morn, you hear the grey feet of the wind stir in the shimmering corn, you hear, low down in the grass, the singing she as they pass, do you ever hear, O oh, little green flame, my loved one calling, whispering my name? O oh, little green leaf on the bough, like my lips you must ever be dumb, for a maiden may never speak until love to her heart says come a mouth in its silence is sweet but my heart cries loud when we meet and i turn my head with a bitter sigh when the boy who has stolen my love unheeding goes by i have made my heart as the stones in the street for his tread i have made my love as the shadow that falls from his dear gold head but the stones with his footsteps ring, and the shadow keeps following, and just as the quiet shadow goes ever beside or before, so must I go silent and lonely and loveless for evermore.
End of A Silent Mouth This recording is in the public domain. His Home and His Own Country From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare In County Antrim, Northern Ireland Situated in the northeast of the province of Ulster His Home and His Own Country I know not whether to laugh or cry so greatly utterly glad am i for one whose beautiful love-lit face the distance hid for a weary space has come this day of all days to me who am his home and his own country what shall i say who am here at rest led from the good things up to the best little to my knowledge but this i know it was god said love each other so o love my love who hast come to me thy love thy home and thy own country Emily Hickey. End of His Home and His Own Country. This recording is in the public domain. Bitter Serenade by Herbert Trench. From the Book of Irish Poetry, Volume 1. Recording by Larry Wilson. Fate damned you young. Death young would now frustrate you. I have but lived as alchemist for gold. In my mad pity's flame to recreate you, Heavenly one, waning cold, Dark planet to your sleepless desolations, Whereto no ray serene hath ever gone, Life might have come with my poor invocations, You might have loved and shown. The lanterns and the gondolas have vanished, Gone the uproar and merry masquerade, From the lagoons the burning loves are banished, all your canal is shade. Magnolia bloom is here my only candle. White petals wash and break along the wall, While this poor lute, the lute with the scorched handle, Is here to tell you all. Do you remember? But what soul remembers? I carved it from a log of quaintest tone, Snatched half consumed out of a great hearth's embers. The great hearth was your own. By God, to the cords wherewith you then endowed us, Something in you gave frame and strings a voice. Now you must listen in the hours allowed us. Listen, you have no choice. The very stars grow dread with tense foretelling of dawn. The bell towers darken in the sky As they would groan before they strike, Revealing new day to such as I. There comes a day too merciless in clearness, Worn to the bone the stubborn must give o'er, there comes a day when to endure in nearness can be endured no more. A man can take the buffets of the tourney, but there's a hurt lady beyond belief, a grief the sun finds not upon his journey marked on the map of grief. Was I not bred of the same clay and vapor and lightning of the universe as you? Had I the selfsame God to be my shaper or cracks the world in two? It cannot be, though I have not of merit, that man may hold so dear, and with such pain enfold with all the tendrils of the spirit, yet not be loved again. It cannot be that such intensest yearning, such fierce and incommensurable care, starred on your face, as though a crystal burning is wasted on the air. It cannot be I gave my soul, unfolding to you its very inmost like a child, utterly giving faith, no jot withholding by you to be beguiled. No, in rich Venice riotous and human that shrinks from me to sandbanks and a sky, love such as that I bear you must be common enough. You let it die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wings of Love by James H. Cousins From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England I will row my boat on Muckross Lake When the grey of the dove comes down at the end of the day And a quiet like prayer grows soft in your eyes And among your fluttering hair the red of the sun is mixed with the red of your cheek. I will row you, O boat of my heart, till our mouths have forgotten to speak in the silence of love. 
broken only by trout that spring and are gone like a fairy's finger that casts a ring with the luck of the world for the hand that can hold it fast i will rest on my oars my eyes on your eyes till our thoughts have passed from the lake and the sky and the rings of the jumping fish till our ears are filled from the reeds with a sudden swish and a sound like the beating of flails in the time of corn we shall hold our breath until a wonderful thing is born from the songs that were chanted by bards in the days gone by for the wild white swan shall be leaving the lake for the sky with a curve of her neck stretched out in a silver spear oh then when the creak of her wings shall have brought her near we shall hear against a swish and a beating of flails and a creaking of oars and a sound like the wind in sails as the mate of her heart shall follow her into the air o wings of my soul we shall think of angus and seer and etain and medea that were changed into wild white swans to fly round the ring of the heavens to the dusks and the dawns and seen by all but true lovers till judgment day because they had loved for love only o oh, love i will say for a woman and man with eternity ringing them round and the heavens above and below them a poor thing it is to be bound to four low walls that will spill like a peddler's pack and a quilt that will run into holes and a churn that will dry and crack oh better than these a dream in the night or our heart's mute prayer that o'donoghue the enchanted man should pass between water and air and say i will change them each to a wild white swan like the lovers angus and medea and their loved ones kier and etain because they have loved for love only and have searched through the shadows of things for the heart of all hearts through the fire of love and the wine of love and the wings end of the wings of love this recording is in the public domain Little Mary Cassidy by Francis A. Fay From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare In County Antrim, Northern Ireland Situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland Little Mary Cassidy Oh, tis little Mary Cassidy's The cause of all my misery And the reason that I am not Now the boy I used to be Oh, she baits the beauties All that we read about in history And sure half the countryside Is as hot for her as me Travel Ireland up and down, hill, village, vale and town, fairer than the Callum Dome you're looking for in vain. Oh, I'd rather live in poverty with little Mary Cassidy than emperor without her be of Germany or Spain. Twas at the dance at Darmoudis that first I caught a sight of her and heard her sing the droning dun till tears came in my eyes, and ever since that blessed hour I'm dreaming day and night of her. The devil a wink of sleep at all I get from bed to rise, Cheeks like the rose in June, Sung like the lark in tune, Working, resting, night or noon, She never leaves my mind. O oh, till singing by my cabin fire Sits little Mary Cassidy, Tis little ease or happiness I'm sure I'll ever find. What is wealth? What is fame? What is all that people fight about? To a kind word from her lips, Or a love glance from her eye. O oh, though troubles throng my breast, Sure, they'd soon go to the right about, If I thought the curly head of her would rest there by and by. Take all I own today, kith, kin, and care away, Ship them all across the say, or to the frozen zone. Leave me an orphan bear, but leave me Mary Cassidy, I never would feel lonesome with the two of us alone. Francis A. Fay End of Little Mary Cassidy This recording is in the public domain. Marlene Oak by Francis A. Farr From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording 
by elaine conway england moeen oog my moeen oog i go put on your latest brogue on your latest brogue and slip into your smartest gown you rosy little rogue for a message kind i bear to yourself from old adair that pat the pipers come around and they'll be dancing there moeen dear i'll not presume to encroach into your room but i'd forget a fairin i'd brought you from mac room so open and i'll swear not one peep upon you there tis a silver net to gather at the glass your golden hair moeen pet my moeen pet fair fay i'm fairly in a fret at the time you're titivating moeen aren't you ready yet now net and gown and brogue are you sure you're quite the vogue but bedad you look so lovely i'll forgive you moeen oak end of moeen oak this recording is in the public domain the yin wee lyric by g f savage armstrong from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england at the board apart she sat and noon te this ye knew te that she taught wi careless kindness for weel a kenned her amazed heart in as she said had little part of half thitty words she heard was minless and though she seemed to shun my sight i trusted mare her love that might than e earth's love's the gither then yin we gentle lyric she gave aid waited lang that lyric to have and lang aid wait for sich another end of the yin we lyric this recording is in the public domain the surely by g f savage armstrong from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england drive bitter blast frae loft tacy a little mania smirtin her ain wee surely's ruined my heart her wee bands pinned at partin am proof the night gen win and snore i'll walk frae here to derry the nose flood its mare cam doon aid face it bold and merry no charlie deary ben ye doon ye jist mon tack my surely i'll wrap it tight aroon your kist for och the night say swally pure lad ye'll fin it unco cord by grandsha shore says eety and then her een lewicked up in mine we are sich love and pity we surely press in saft and worm a roon my breast a glowin a kiss ye flinge a hug ye fast a mock the squalls a blowin yet then as roar let lightnings claim i'll face the tempest brawly whilst close again my throbbing heart i feel my loves we surely end of the surely this recording is in the public domain the wee lassie's first love by g f savage armstrong from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org 
Recording by Elaine Conway, England. How can ye hear his name and hide? My thought we only add. How can ye see him come and come? The flittering o'er my heart. It's pain to meet him when I walk, or meet him nay ava. I wish him a to come to me. I wish him a awa. I dinna ken what's wrang wi me. I'm fixed. I kenny why. I kenny talk. I kenny walk. My mins are ganged. Agly. I say such foolish things at whiles. My face is scorched wi pain. Oh, let them laugh me tape myself. I just would be alone. I'm ne say at all as Elsie Barnes. I hain it in like maize. Yet aft he comes frae May to me. I near we Elsie strays. I can e thaw to see him laugh. Wi grace or rose or jean. And yet he's standing nigh my side. Me aft than ony ain. He's a say courteous kin and free we mon and lass and chill mayhap he cares nay mair for me than jist te wish me weel but ah the kinness oh of his voice and ah his dark blue e and ah his face and courtly grace i think i jist could de end of the wee lass's first love this recording is in the public domain. Cotton Rushes from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare, in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. Cotton Rushes. Oh, maybe it was yesterday, or fifty years ago. Myself was risen early, on a day for cotton rushes. Walkin up the Brabla burn, still the sun was low. Now I'd hear the burn run, and then I'd hear the thrushes. Young, still young, and drenchin' wet the grass, wet the golden honeysuckle hangin' sweetly down. Here, lad, here, will ye follow where I pass, and find me cotton rushes on the mountain? Then was it only yesterday, or fifty years or so, rippin' round the bog pools, high among the heather, the hook it made me hand sore. I had to leave it go. Twas he that cut the rushes, then for me to bind together. Come, dear, come, and back along the burn. See the darling honeysuckle hanging like a crown. Quick, one kiss, sure, there's someone at the turn. Oh, we're after cutting rushes on the mountain. Yesterday, yesterday, or fifty years ago. I waken out of dreams when I hear the summer thrushes. Oh, that's Brabla burn. I can hear it sing and flow, for all that's fair. I'll sooner see a bunch of green rushes. Run, burn, run. Can you mind when we were young? The honeysuckle hangs above. The pool is dark and brown. Sing, burn, sing. Can you mind the song you sung? The day we cut the rushes on the mountain. Moira O'Neill End of Cutting Rushes This recording is in the public domain. Little Child I Call Thee by Douglas Hyde, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Volume One, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. From the Irish, little child, I call thee fair, clad in hair of golden hue, every lock and ringlets falling down to almost kiss the dew, slow gray eye and languid mien, brows as thin as stroke of quill, cheeks of white with scarlet through them, ah. It's through them I am ill. Luscious mouth, delicious breath, Chalk-white teeth and very small, Lovely nose and little chin, White neck thin, she is swan-like all. Pure white hand and shapely finger, Limbs that linger like a song, Music speaks in every motion Of my seamew, warm and young. Rounded breasts and lime-white bosom, Like a blossom touched of none, Stately form and slender waist, far more graceful than the swan. Alas for me, I would I were with her of the soft-fingered palm, in Waterford to steal a kiss, 
or by the list whose heirs are balm. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Eileen Arun from the Book of Irish Poetry Part One Read for Librivox dot org Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the province of Ulster. Eileen Arun after the Irish When like the early rose Eileen Arun Beauty in childhood blows Eileen Arun When like a diadem buds blush around the stem Which is the fairest gem? Eileen Arun is it the laughing eye, Eileen Arun? Is it the timid sigh, Eileen Arun? Is it the tender tone, soft as the stringed harp's moan? Oh, it is truth alone, Eileen Arun. When like the rising day, Eileen Arun, love sends his early ray, Eileen Arun, what makes his dawning glow, changeless through joy or woe, only the constant know, Eileen Arun. I know a valley fair, Eileen Arun, I knew a cottage there, Eileen Arun, far in that valley shade, I knew a gentle maid, flower of a hazel glade, Eileen Arun, who in the song so sweet, Eileen Arun, who in the dance so fleet, Eileen Arun, dear were her charms to me, dearer her laughter free, dearest her constancy, Eileen Arun, were she no longer true, Eileen Arun, what should her lover do? Eileen Arun, fly with his broken chain, far o'er the sounding main, never to love again. Eileen Arun, youth must with time decay. Eileen Arun, beauty must fade away. Eileen Arun, castles are sacked in war, chieftains are scattered far. Truth is a fixed star. Eileen Arun, Gerald Griffin. End of Eileen Arun, this recording is in the public domain. Song by Thomas MacDonagh From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England Love is cruel, love is sweet Cruel, sweet lovers sigh till lovers meet Sigh and meet, sigh and meet And sigh again, cruel sweet, O oh, sweetest pain Love is blind, but love is sly, blind and sly. Thoughts are bold, but words are shy, bold and shy, bold and shy, and bold again. Sweet is boldness, shyness, pain. End of song. This recording is in the public domain. Now. From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org For me, my friend, no graveside vigil keep, With tears that memory and remorse might fill. Give me your tenderest laughter, earthbound still, And when I die, you shall not want to weep. No epitaph for me with virtues, Deep punctured in marble, pitiless and chill. But when playtime is over, if you will, The songs that soothe beloved babes to sleep. No Lenten lilies on my breast and brow Be laid when I am silent. Roses red, and golden roses bring me here instead, That if you love or bear me, I may know. I may not know nor care when I am dead. Give me your songs and flowers and laughter now. End of Now Amor Fons Amoris by Edmund G. A. Holmes From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England 
I love all men the better, O oh, love, for loving thee. The dear ones whom I cherish are dearer still to me. Each stranger is my kinsman, and ever for thy sake, beloved at love's bidding, new springs of love awake. I love all things the better, for loving thee the best. My thoughts of thee make deeper the glories of the west. My hopes of thee make fresher the fragrance of the spring, and when thy accents haunt me, the birds move more sweetly sing. I love the whole world better for loving thee so well. Love tells my soul the sweet which tongue I never tell. I learn when thou art near me that loss is more than gain, that not a pang is wasted, that not a hope is vain, even love. The dream, the vision, that floods the world with light, lit by the flame, thy kind lest, grows more divinely bright. His beauty wins new beauty from shining through thine eyes, and when he claims my homage, he comes in thy sweet guise. Heroes polishing their glowing weapons, blowing trumpets loudly martial, a frost foggy wind with whistling darts flying these are the sounds of music that delight at early morn end of amor fons amoris this recording is in the public domain ancient irish ran from the book of irish poetry part 1 read for librivox.org Recording by James White Heroes polishing their glowing weapons, Blowing trumpets loudly martial, A frost foggy wind with whistling darts flying, These are the sounds of music that delight at early morn. End of Ancient Irish Ran This recording is in the public domain. Cucullin's Wooing from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org, recording by James White. Great-limbed and swift and beautiful past any dream he came to her, from Owen Maca through a land for gladness of the spring astir, and on the flutes of morning blown strong joy that took for breath no pause, the song of breeze and stream and bird the herald of his coming was. Yea, and through all her April ways, to Erin's utmost sea-girt rim, through waking seed and blade and leaf, green nature laughed for joy of him. And where he held his sun-bright course, straight sped as arrow on its flight, men thronged as to a pageant wrought by the high gods for their delight. And seeing with a fairer faith the deathless mighty ones adored, who thus unto their Ulster's need had shaped at once a shield and sword. So through the singing land he passed, the peerless warden of her fame. So lord himself of love and war, unto his fair-faced love he came. Eleanor R. Cox End of Cucullin's Wooing This recording is in the public domain. Leah's Summons to Cucullin From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by James White Rise, champion of old Tonia's need, From sickness freed to strength awake. All miss thee from King Connor's levy, For him thy heavy slumber break. Behold, his steel-clad shoulders glare, His trumpets blare for battle press. Behold, his chariots sweep the glen, He marshals men as though for chess. His red branch knights with spear on loop, his maiden troop, tall and serene, his vassal kings, a battle storm, by each the form of his fair queen. Look forth, the winter hath begun, now one by one its marvels mark. Behold, for it beseems thee well, its long cold spells, its hueless dark. This rest inglorious is not good, weak lassitude from wanton strife. Such long repose is drunkenness, such sleep no less than death in life. This trance, as of a toping churl, With mighty ardor hurl away, 
Forth from thy bed of impotence, Leap, champion prince, to front the fray. End of Leah's Summons to Cucullin This recording is in the public domain. Where is the Sweetest Music? by George Sigerson From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England From the Dean of Lismore's Book Noble news of song and valour Bear I ballast fought within Little need I who may hearken If my song be heard of Finn Men were gay in golden Ain, hill and hall in far and wide. Feast was spread and music flowing, and we saw our Finn reside. Ossian staunch and Dermot stately, sate by Lue, greatly strong, and their friends. At feast and foray, ancient Conan, Oscar Young. Speak, ye champion, chiefs rejoicing, rang the voice of Finn around. Tell me each in answer meetest, where is sweetest music found? There's one music fit for farming. Give me gaming, Conan cried. Strong his hand for crash of combat, but his head was sense denied. Song of swords, for war unsheathing. With quick breathing came the word, Throng of blows when falling fleetest, Seemed the sweetest, Oscar heard, There is music more endearing, Dark-eyed Dermot did declare, Nought comes nigh the voice's cadence, When the maiden soft and fair, Sweet a song at dawning dewy, Said Macluay, sharp of spear, When the bounding dogs are crying, and we race the flying deer. This is song, and this is music, spoke our lofty leader old, blowing breeze mid moving banners, and an army neath their gold. Then I fear no bardic passion, Ossian said our captain strong, with my faithful piano round me, this to me is harp and song. End of Where is the Sweetest Music? This recording is in the public domain. The Giant Walker from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for Leprovox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. Situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. The Giant Walker. This and the succeeding poem, The Washer of the Ford, are not literal versions although they are the substance of original legends, and are given as specimens of the supernatural figures in Celtic romance. They are from Sir Samuel Ferguson's epic poem of Congal, the Giant Walker, or the Burich, and Koita Rachna, the churl with the grey cloak, is a familiar figure in both Highland and Irish legend, and has also been made the subject of a poem by James Clarence Mangan, under the title of the churl with the grey coat. The washer of the ford is paraphrased with considerable literalness from a passage in Macreath's Wars of Turloch, the apparition appearing to the clan Brian Rowe. Around the mound of sighs they filled the woody sided vale, but no sweet sleep their eyes. Refresh that night for all the night, around their echoing camp was heard continuous from the hills a sound as of the tramp of giant footsteps, but so thick the white mist lay around, none saw the walker save the king. He, starting at the sound, called to his foot his fierce red hound, athwart his shoulders cast, a shaggy mantle, grasped his spear, and through the moonlight passed, alone up dark Ben Bolly's heights, toward which above the woods, with sound as when a close of eve, the noise of falling floods is borne to shepherd's ear remote on stilly upland lawn. The steps along the mountainside with hollow fall came on. Fast beat the hero's heart, and close down crouching by his knee, trembled the hound, while through the haze, huge as three mists at sea, the weak, long, sleepless mariner descries some mountain cape. Wreck, infamous, rise on his lee, appeared a monstrous shape striding 
impatient, like a man much grieved, he walks alone, considering of a cruel wrong, down from his shoulders thrown, a mantle, skirted stiff, with soil splashed from the miry ground, at every stride against his calves struck with his loud rebound, as makes the mainsail of a ship brought up along the blast, when with the coil of all its ropes it beats the sounding mast, so striding fast, the giant passed, the king held fast his breath, motionless save his throbbing heart, and still and chill as death, stood listening while, a second time, the giant took the round of all the camp, but when at length, for the third time, the sound came up, and through the parting haze, a third time huge and dim, rose out the shape, the valiant hound sprang forth and challenged him, and forth, disdaining that a dog should put him so to shame, sprang Congal, and essayed to speak. Dread shadow, stand, proclaim what wouldst thou, that thou, thus all night around, my camp shouldst keep the troublous vigil, banishing the wholesome gift of sleep from all our eyes who, though inured to dreadful sounds and sights by land and sea, have never yet in all our perilous nights lain in the ward of such a guard. The ship made answer none, but with stern wafture, of his hand, went angrier striding on, shaking the earth with heavier steps, then Congal, on his track, sprang fearless. Answer me, thy churl, he cried, I bid thee back. But while he spoke the giant's cloak around his shoulders grew, like to a black bulged thunder cloud, and sudden out there flew, from all its angry swelling folds, with uproar unconfined. Direct against the king's pursuit a mighty blast of wind, loud flapped the mantle tempest lined, while fluttering down the gale, as leaves in autumn, man and hound, were swept into the veil, and heard o'er all the huge uproar, through startled Dalaray, the giant went with stamp and clash, departing south away, Sir Samuel Ferguson. End of the Giant Walker. This recording is in the public domain. The Washer of the Ford by Sir Samuel Ferguson From the Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare In County Antrim, Northern Ireland Situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland The Washer of the Ford And now at dawn to cross the fords Hard by the royal town The fresh, well-ordered, vigorous bands In gallant ranks drew down When, lo, a sceptre horrible Of more than human size Full in the middle of the ford Took all their wandering eyes a ghastly woman it appeared with grey dishevelled hair blood draggled and with sharp boned arms and fingers crooked and spare dabbing and washing in the ford where mid leg deep she stood beside a heap of heads and limbs that swam in oozing blood where on and on a glittering heap of raiment rich and brave with swift pernicious hands she scooped and poured the crimson wave and though the stream approaching her ran tranquil clear and bright sand gleaming between verdant banks a fair and peaceful sight Downward the blood polluted flood rode turbid, strong and proud, with heady, eddy, dangerous whirls and surges dashing loud. All stood aghast, but Keelik cried, Advance me to the bank, I'll speak the hag. But back instead his trembling bearers shrank. Then Congal from the foremost rank, a spear cast forward strode, and said, Who art thou, hideous one, and from what cursed abode? Comest thou thus in open day the hearts of men to freeze? And whose lopped heads and severed limbs and bloody vests are these? I am the washer of the ford, she answered, and my race is of the truth, the Danon line of magic, and my place for toil is in the running streams of urn, and my cave for sleep is in the middle of the shell heaped carn of Meave, high up on haunted Nocnari, and this fine carnage heap before me and these silken vests and mantles which I steep, thus in the running water are the severed heads and hands, and spear-torn scarfs, and tunics, of these gay-dressed gallant bands, whom thou, O Congal, leadest to death, and this, the fury said, uplifting by the clodic locks, what seemed a dead man's head, is thine own head, O Congal, wherewith she rose in air, and vanished from the warriors, leaving the river bare, of all but running water. Sir Samuel Ferguson End of The Washer of the Ford This recording is in the public domain. A dirge for King Neal of the Nine Hostages 
from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Haridev Tadij Jaipur. Tuerun, son of Torla, when we hosted forth afar, with Echu, son of Valor, yellow as the primrose star, I saw his tresses shine. Torun, for the fancy that compares, the crown of golden pallor, the primrose wears with Nial's hairs, a born maid should be thine. Tuerun, son of Thorna, brown and lashes dusky soft, of equal arch and cluster, eyes as both flowers in a croft, or hyacinth blue. Then the carmine of his cheeks, unchanging in their lustre, not the fairy foxglove streaks, may words with such a hue. Thorna, laughter rare, red lips that ne'er, reproved with scornful blaming, hero front in battle brunt, eclipsing all beside. A harvest moon, a fairy noon, a beacon fiercely flaming, a dragon ship he glowed and rode on war's tumultuous tide. Tuerun, son of Torna, keen on keen as carry poured, above his press is flexing, till my grief heart high stood for Muradak's grandson great. Erin Alba now shall dread the onset of the Saxon, now that Echo's son lies dead, O oh, black reproachful fate. Torna, Saxon's horde shall shouting come, and swans of Lombard strangers, from the hour that Nia lay down, are guile and pick dismayed? Tuen, son of Torna, ah, that still on Tara's tower, bright star in darkest dangers, with tresses of the iris flower, he stood, a stalwart aid. Torna, great delight, great peace it was, dear son of my affection, after thee for some high cause, in company to go. Tuen, son of Torna, Hero of the shoulder white, beneath whose strong protection, host and host we face the fight, but never fled the foe. End of a Diraj for King Nial of the Nine Hostages. This recording is in the public domain. The Song of the Sword of Carol from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Addressed about AD 909 to Dallin Mac Moore, Chief Bard to King Carol Mac Murigan, by an unknown poet. Bright battle joy of the gale, war's great woof sharply unthreading. Chieftain on chieftain beheading, Sword of cow, all hail, Oft on a foreman's soil, With kings of council forth raiding, Ever a worthy one aiding, Hast thou divided the spoil, Still in a strong white hand pursuing Thy dread, red reaping, Till night's shadows were weeping, O'er the Laganian land, Many a man of might, Thy ravening radiance wielded, where was the shield, but yielded, pierced by its venomous bite? Enna of noble bands for forty years without sorrow, brandished thee morrow by morrow, safe in his strenuous hands. Enna, no mean heirloom, to Dunling his son did bequeath thee, still his foeman beneath thee fell, Till thou broughtest him doom, many a prince, proud mounted, possessed the ear, Dermot the fierce, with thee to hew and to pierce, sixteen summers had counted. Then, when his powers decreased, and a mightier master was owed thee, on Murigan Dermot bestowed thee, even at Allen's feast. Forty the years of thy sway with Murigan, high king of Allen. Never a one, sang Dallin, passed without warfare away. Morrigan, Viking earth, 
at wexford gave thee to carol thou wert his partner in peril long as he paced yellow earth red was thy rallying point at odba the field of the strangers scorner of valorous dangers breaker of body and joint crimson thy edge in its stain at belach moon wast thou proven fierce that fight as an oven angered all alfie's plain round thee a goodly host at danochta melted asunder through thee aid wars wander as leafin yielded to the ghost through thee an army grew thin when thy lightning struck into slumber flanagan's son and his number high-walled tara within from the southward they fled out of boyne of the rough feet fella when at thy stroke catching pallor Hnovna, the noble dropped dead furious too was thy force as the bolt from a black cloud's rattle when in the front of the battle ale hill of falacorse never an hour of defeat hadst thou with a fair meadowed carol just was he ever in quarrel faithful in every feat gladly danced by each day thy gleesome nights were unreckoned monarchs at sundown beckoned thee into combat away when henceforth shalt thou curse or to victory's goal be starting with whom since carol's departing be bedded for better or worse weapon of hero on hero fear not thou shalt ever lie rusted still for a champion trusted forth on his foes thou shalt spring proudest prize of the gale shall glorious nas repute thee fin of the feasts shall salute thee sword of the cowl all hail end of the song of the sword of carol this recording is in the public domain king ailil's death by whitley stokes from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england from the book of leinster i know who won the peace of god the old king ailil of the ban who fought beyond the irish sea all day against a connaught clan the king was rooted in the flight he muttered to his charioteer look back the slaughter is it red the slayers are they drawing near the man looked back the west wind blew dead clansman's hair against his face he heard the war shout of his foes the death cry of his ruined face the foes came darting from the height like pine trees down a swollen fall like heaps of hay in flood his clan swept on or sank he saw it all and spake the slaughter is full red and we may still be saved by flight then groaned the king no sin of theirs falls on my people here to-night no sin of theirs but sin of mine for i was worst of evil kings unrighteous wrathful hurling down to death was shame or weaker things draw rein and turn the chariot round my face against the foeman bend when i am seen and slain mayhap the slaughter of my tribe will end they drew and turned down came the foe the king fell cloven on the sod the slaughter then was stayed and so king ailil won the peace of god End of King Elil's Death This recording is in the public domain. Rebel Mother's Lullaby by Shane Leslie From the Book of Irish Poetry, Volume 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Ah, rest to the morrow, for many the sorrow that waking will brew gone is thy brother long must i rue hark not thy mother rocking thee to rocking thee fro lenavan mo ireland's own woe 
Never must keep children from sleep, Lena von Mo. The clouds are fast creeping, and Mary is weeping her tears down the sky. Gray is the evening when Irishmen die. Hark not the keening, rest thee and lie. Lena von Mo, Lena von Mo, far be the foe, ours is the strife, yours is dear life, Lena von Mo. Earl Garrett is hiding, Lord Edward is riding, and fast is his reign. The horses are stamping over the plain. Hark not the tramping. Turn thee again, Lena von Mo, Lena von Mo. Nestle down low. Others may ride. You must abide, Lena von Mo. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O Hussey's Ode to the Maguire by James Clarence Mangan From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Elaine Conway, England From the Irish Where is my chief, my master, this bleak night, Mavrome? Oh, cold, cold, miserably cold, is this bleak night for Hugh. It showery, arrowy, speary sleet, pierceth one through and through, pierceth one to me, very bone. Rolls real thunder, or was that red, livid light only a meteor? I scarce know, but through that midnight dim, the pitiless ice wind streams except the hate that persecutes him nothing how crueler venomy might an awful a tremendous night is this meseems the floodgates of the river of heaven i think have been burst wide down from the overcharged clouds like unto headlong ocean's tide descends grey rain in roaring streams though he were even a wolf ranging the round green woods though he were even a pleasant salmon in the unchain unchainable sea though he were a wild mountain eagle he could scarce bear he this sharp sore sleet these howling floods oh mournful is my soul this night for hugh maguire darkly as in a dream he strays before him and behind triumphs the serranus anger of the wounding wind the wounding wind that burns as fire it is my bitter grief it cuts me to the heart that in the country of clan darry this should be his fate oh woe to me where is he wandering houseless desolate alone without or guide or chart my dreams i see just now his face the strawberry bright uplifted to the blackened heavens while the tempestuous winds blow fiercely over and round him and the smitting sleet shower blinds the hero of galang to-night large large affliction unto me and mine it is that one of his majestic bearing his fair stately form should thus be tortured and o'erborne that this unsparing storm should wreak its wrath on head like his that has great hand so oft the avenger of the oppressed should this chill churlish night perchance be paralysed by frost while through some icicle hung thicket as one lawn and lost he walks and wanders without rest the tempest-driven torrent deluges the mead it overflows the low banks of the rivulets and ponds the lawns and pasture grounds lie locked in icy bonds so that the cattle cannot feed the pale bright margins of the streams are seen by none rushes and sweeps along the untable flood on every side it penetrates and fills the cottagers dwellings far and wide water and land are blent in one through some dark wood mid bones of monsters hugh now strays and he confronts the storm with anguished heart but manly brow 
oh what a sword wound to that tender heart of his were now a backward glance at peaceful days but other thoughts are his thoughts that can still inspire with joy and onward bounding hope the bosom of magnee thoughts of his warriors charging like bright billows of the sea borne on the wind's wings flashing fire and though frost blaze to-night the clear dew of his eyes and white ice gauntlets glove his noble fine fair fingers oh a warm dress is to him that lightning garb he ever wore the lightning of the soul not skies a friend hugh marched forth to the fight i grieve to see him so depart and lo to-night he wanders frozen rain drenched sad betrayed but the memory of the lime-white mansions his right hand hath laid in ashes warms the hero's heart end of o hussey's ode to the maguire this recording is in the public domain A Lament for the Red Earl by Richard Mahoney From the Book of Irish Poetry, Volume 1 Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson His grave is lone by Guadalquiver, And low is his young heart laid, Where the quiet waves of the yellow river Sleep in the linden shade. But hard and cold lies foreign mould Beneath that royal head. Oh, had he fallen in the ringing battle, out by Dungannon's side, where the Norman rout, like driven cattle, choked Avon's swirling tide. Then should my grief find proud relief when I sang how the Red Earl died. But I am come to this pale river, weeping from far away, where my dear Avon rolls forever, pure as the dewy ray, when soft and bright the summer night kisses the lingering day. Oh, lovingly that light is lying on grey Dunluce's hold, where the breath of night comes shoreward sighing, low sighing as of old, and soft asleep the shadows creep far up the spears of gold. But I must watch by this pale river, weary and lone and grey, and my grief's tide must roll forever, wearing this heart away, deep as the wave, dark as his grave, cold as my hero's clay. In the poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lament for the Death of Organ Ruad O'Neill by Thomas Davis. From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part One. Read for LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Did they dare? Did they dare? To slay Organ Rod O'Neill? Yes, they slew with poison him, they feared to meet with steel. May God wither up their hearts, may their blood cease to flow, may they walk in living death, who poison Organ Rod. Though it break my heart to hear, say again the bitter words, from Derry against Cromwell, he marched to measure swords. But the weapon of the Sassanach met him on his way, and he died at Cloch Yachta upon St. Leonard's Day. Wail, wail ye for the mighty one, wail, wail ye for the dead, quench the hearth and hold the breath, with ashes strew the head. How tenderly we loved him, how deeply we deplore. Holy Saviour, but to think we shall never see him more. Sagest in the council was he, kindest in the hall. Sure we never won a battle, twas Owen won them all. Had he lived, had he lived, our dear country had been free. But he's dead, but he's dead, and his slaves will ever be. But Farrell and Clan Ricard, Preston and Red Hugh, Audley and McMahon, ye valiant, wise and true. But what are ye all to our darling who is gone? The rudder of our ship was he, our castle's cornerstone. Wail, wail him through the island, 
weep weep for our pride would that on the battlefield our gallant chief had died weep the victor of bien burb weep him young and old weep for him ye women your beautiful lies cold we thought you would not die we were sure you would not go and leave us in our utmost need to cromwell's cruel blow sleep without a shepherd when the snow shuts out the sky oh why did you leave us Jurgen? why did you die soft as woman's was your voice so new bright was your eye oh why did you leave us o Jurgen? why did you die your troubles are all over you're at rest with god on high but we're slaves and we're orphans Jurgen. why did you die end of the lament for the death of Jurgen rahado odile this recording is in the public domain the maiden city by charlotte elizabeth tonner from the book of irish poetry part one read for librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england in sixteen eighty six richard talbot was sent to ireland by james the second to command the army with the title of earl of tyrconnell and a year later he was made viceroy who was a catholic it being the policy of james to restore to the catholics many of their rights tyrconnell wished to introduce some catholics into the corporations of the large cities derry absolutely refused to admit them and when lord antrim was sent with one thousand two hundred men to enforce the order the pretences of derry closed the gates in their faces when he deposed king james after landing in ireland in sixteen eighty nine marched to derry he was treated in the same way by the sturdy sons of the city where for all his swelling waters rolls northward to the main here queen of erin's daughters fair derry fixed her reign a holy temple crowned her and commerce graced her street a rampart wall was round her the river at her feet and here she sat alone boys and looking from the hill vowed the maiden on her throne boys would be a maiden still from antrim crossing over in famous eighty eight a plumed and belted lover came to the ferry gate she summoned to defend our sires and beardless race who shouted no surrender and slammed it in his face then in a quiet tone boys they told him twas their will that the maiden on her throne boys should be a maiden still next crashing all before him a kingly wooer came the royal banner over him blushed crimson deep for shame he showed the pope's commission nor dreamed to be refused she pitied his condition but begged to stand excused in short the fact is known boys she chased him from the hill the maiden on her throne boys would be a maiden still on our brave sires descending was then the tempest broke their peaceful dwellings rending mid blood and flame and smoke that hallowed graveyard yonder smiles with the slaughter dead o oh, brothers pause and ponder it was for us they bled and while their gift we own boys the fane that tops our hill o oh, the maiden on her throne boys shall be a maiden still nor wily tongue shall move us nor tyrant arm affright we'll look to one above us who ne'er forsook the right who will may crouch and tender the birthright of the free brothers no surrender no compromise for me we want no barrier stone boys no gates to guard the hill yet the maiden on her throne boys shall be a maiden still end of the maiden city this recording 
is in the public domain. The Battle of the Boyne From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. July, the first of a morning fair. In 1690 famous, King William did his men prepare To fight with false King Seamus. King James, he pitched his tents between, the lines for to retire. But King William threw his bomb balls in, and set them all on fire. Thereat revenge the Irish vowed, upon King William's forces, and vehemently with cries did crowd, to check their forward courses. A ball from out their batteries flew, as our king he faced their fire. His shoulder knot away it shot, quoth he, pray come no nigher. Then straight his officers he did call, saying, Gentlemen, mind your station, and prove your valor one and all before this Irish nation. My brazen walls let no man break, and your subtle foes you'll scatter. Let us show them today good English play as we go over the water. Then horses and foot we marched amain, resolved their ranks to batter. But the brave Duke Schomburg he was slain as he went over the water. Then King William cried, Feel no dismay at the losing of one commander, for God shall be our king today, and I'll be general under. Then stoutly we Boyne River crossed to give the Irish battle. Our cannon to his dreadful course like thunderclaps did rattle. In majestic mien our prince rode o'er, the stream ran red with slaughter, as with blow and shout we put to rout our enemies over the water. End of the Battle of the Boyne. This recording is in the public domain. A Ballad of Sarsfield or the Bursting of the Guns From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org This intercepting of Dick Inkle's siege train on its way to Limerick is one of the most famous episodes in the career of the gallant Patrick Sarsfield. Sarsfield rode out, the Dutch to rout, and to take and break their cannon. To mass went he at half past three, and at four he crossed the Shannon. Turconnell slept, in dream he thought, old fields of victory ran on, and the chieftains of Thomond in Limerick's towers slept well by the banks of the Shannon. He rode ten miles and he crossed the ford, and couched in the wood and waited, Till, left and right, on marched in sight, that host which the true man hated. Charge, Sarsfield cried, and the green hill side, as they charged, replied in thunder. They rode o'er the plain, and they rode o'er the slain, and the rebel right lay under. He burned the gear the knaves held dear, for his king he fought, not plunder. With powder they crumbed the guns, and rammed their mouths the red soil under. The spark flashed out like a nation's shout, the sound into heaven ascended. The hosts of the sky made to earth reply, and the thunders twain were blended. Sarsfield rode out, the Dutch to rout, and to take and break their cannon. A century after, Sarsfield's laughter was echoed from Dungannon. By Aubrey de Vere End of a ballad of Sarsfield or the bursting of the guns this recording is in the public domain. A Ballad of Athlone, Second Siege, or How They Broke Down the Bridge, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. When the Jacobite War was renewed, De Ginkle besieged Athlone, which was held by St. Ruth. The gallant action described in the poem only delayed the taking of the town a short while. Does any man dream that a gale can fear? Of a thousand deeds let him learn but one. The Shannon swept onward, broad and clear, between the leaguers and broad Athlone. Break down the bridge. Six warriors rushed through the storm of shot and the storm of shell. With late but certain victory flushed, the grim Dutch gunners eyed them well. They wrenched at the planks made a hail of fire. They fell in death, their work half done. The bridge stood fast, and nigh and nigher, 
the foe swarm darkly, densely on. Oh, who for erring will strike a stroke, who hurl yon planks where the waters war? Six warriors forth from their comrades broke, and flung them upon that bridge once more. Again at the rocking planks they dashed, and four dropped dead and two remained. The huge beams groaned and the ark down crashed. Two stalwart swimmers the margin gained. Saint Ruth in his stirrups stood up and cried, I have seen no deed like that in France. With a toss of his head, Sarsfield replied, They had luck, the dogs, t'was a merry chance. Oh, many a year upon Shannon's side, they sang upon moor and they sang upon heath, of the twain that breasted that raging tide, and the ten that shook bloody hands with death. By Aubrey de Vere End of a Ballad of Athlone, Second Siege, or How They Broke Down the Bridge This recording is the public domain. After the Battle of Ockrim From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Athlone fell. St. Ruth retreated to Ockrim in Galway, where on July the 12th a decisive battle was fought. St. Ruth was slain and the Irish utterly defeated. No quarter was given by the English, so that the battle ended in wholesale and horrible slaughter. Night closed around the conqueror's way, and lightnings showed the distant hill where those who lost that dreadful day stood few and faint but fearless still. The soldiers' hope, the patriots' zeal, forever dimmed, forever crossed. Oh, who shall say what heroes feel when all but life and honour is lost? The last sad hour of freedom's dream and valour's task moved slowly by, while mute they watched till morning's beam should rise and give them light to die. There is yet a world where souls are free, where tyrants taint not nature's bliss. If death that world's bright opening be, oh, who would live a slave in this? By Thomas More End of After the Battle of Ockrim This recording is in the public domain. A Farewell to Patrick Sarsfield The Book of Irish Poetry Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, situated in the northeast of the island of Ireland. A farewell to Patrick Sarsfield from the Irish. Farewell, O Patrick Sarsfield, may luck be on your path. Your camp is broken up, your work is marred for years, but you go to kindle into flame the King of France's wrath, though you leave sick air in tears. Ouch, ouch, run. May the white sun and moon bring glory on your head. All hero as you are, and holy man of God, to you the Saxons owe a many an hour of dread in the land you have often trod. Oach, Ochron, the son of Mary guard you and bless you to the end. Tis altered is the time since your legions were astir, when at Cullen you were hailed as the conqueror and friend, and you crossed narrow water near Burr. Ouch, Ochron, I'll journey to the north over Mount Moor and wave. T'was there I first beheld, drawn up in file and line, the brilliant Irish hosts. They were bravest of the brave, but alas, they scorned to combine. Ouch, ouch, hmm. on the bridge of the Boyne was our first overthrow. By Stanley the next, for we paddled without rest. The third was at Ogram, O oh, er, thy woe is a sore in my bleeding breast. Ouch, ouch, hmm. oh, the roof above our heads, it was barbarously fired, while the black orange guns blazed and bellowed around, and as volley followed volley, Colonel Mitchell inquired whether Lucan still stood his ground. Och, och one, but O'Kelly still remains to defy and to toil. He has memories that hell won't permit him to forget, and the sword that will make the blue blood flow like oil upon many an ogram yet. Och, och one. And I never shall believe that my fatherland can fall, while with the Burks and the Jicks and the son of Royal James, and Talbot the captain, and Sarsfield above all, the beloved of damsels and dames, Och, Och, one, James Clarence Mangan.
End of A Farewell to Patrick Sarsfield. This recording is in the public domain. Fontenoy, 1745, from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. One, before the battle, night. O oh, bad the march, the weary march, beneath these alien skies. But could the night, the friendly night that soothes our tired eyes, and bad the war, the tedious war that keeps us sweltering here. But could the hour, the friendly hour that brings the battle near, that brings us on the battle, that summons to their share the homeless troops, the banished men, the exiled sons of Clare. O little Corka Baskin, the wild, the bleak, the fair. O little stony pastures, whose flowers are sweet if rare. O rough, the rude Atlantic, the thunderous, the wide, whose kiss is like a soldier's kiss, which will not be denied. The whole night long we dream of you, and waking, think we're there. Vain dream and foolish waking, we never shall see Clare. The wind is wild tonight, there's battle in the air. The wind is from the west, and it seems to blow from Clare. Have you nothing, nothing for us, loud brawler of the night? No news to warm our heartstrings, to speed us through the fight. In this hollow, star-pricked darkness, as in the sun's hot glare, in sun-tide, in star-tide, we thirst, we starve for Clare. Hark, yonder through the darkness, one distant rat-a-tat, the old foe stirs out there, God bless his soul for that. The old foe musters strongly, he's coming on at last, and Clare's brigade may claim its own, wherever blows fall fast. Send us, ye western breezes, our full, our rightful share, for faith and fame and honor, and the ruined hearths of Clare. End of Fontenoy, 1745, Part 1. This recording is in the public domain. Fontenoy, 1745. From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org. 2. After the battle, early dawn, Clare Coast. Mary Mother, shield us. Say what men are ye, sweeping past so swiftly on this morning sea. Without sails or rowlocks, merrily we glide, home to Corkabaskin on the brimming tide. Jesus save you, gentry, why are you so white, sitting all so straight and still in this misty light? Nothing ails us, brother, joyous souls are we, sailing home together on the morning sea. Cousins, friends, and kinsfolk, children of the land, here we come together, a merry, rousing band, sailing home together from the last great fight, home to Clare from Fontenoy in the morning light. Men of Corkabaskin, men of Clare's brigade, hearken the stony hills of Clare, hear the charge we made, see us come together, singing from the fight, home to Corkabaskin in the morning light. End of Fontenoy, 1745, Part 2. This recording is in the public domain. Clare's Dragoons by Thomas Davis From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Read for LibriVox.org by phone. Viva la, for Ireland's wrong, and viva la, for Ireland's right. Viva la, in the battle throng, for a Spanish steed and sabre bright. The brave old lord died near the fight, but for each drop he lost that night. A Saxon cavalier shall bite the dust before Lord Clare's dragoons. For never, when our spurs were set, and never, when our sabres met, could we, the Saxon soldiers, get to stand the shock of Clare's dragoons. Viva la, for the new brigade. Viva la, the old one too. Viva la, the rose shall fade, and the shamrock shine forever new. Another Clare is here to lead, the worthy son of such a breed. The French expect some famous deed, when Clare leads on his bold dragoons. Our colonel comes from Brian's race, his wounds are in his breast and face, 
the gap of danger is still his place, the foremost of his bold dragoons. Viva la, the new brigade, viva la, the old one too. Viva la, the rose shall fade, and the shamrock shine for ever new. There's not a man in the squadron here was ever known to flinch or fear, though first in charge, the last in rear, have ever been Lord Clare's dragoons. But see, we'll soon have work to do, to shame our boast or prove them true, for hither comes the English crew to sweep away Lord Clare's dragoons. Viva la, for Ireland's wrong, Viva la, for Ireland's right. Viva la, in battled throng, for a Spanish steed and sabre bright. O comrades, think how Ireland pines, her exiled lords, her rifled shrines, her dearest hope, the ordered lines, and bursting charge of Clare's dragoons. Then fling your green flag to the sky, be limerick your battle cry, and charge till blood floats fetlock high around the track of Clare's dragoons. Viva la, the new brigade, viva la, the old one too. Viva la, the rose shall fade, and the shamrock shine forever new. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fermona by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Read for LibriVox.org by phone The French army, including a part of the Irish Brigade, under Marshal Villeroy, held the fortified town of Cremona during the winter of 1702. Prince Eugene, with the Imperial Army, surprised it one morning, and, owing to the treachery of a priest, occupied the whole city before the alarm was given. Villeroy was captured, together with many of the French garrison. The Irish, however, consisting of the regiments of Dillon and Burke, held a fort commanding the river gate, and defended themselves all day, in spite of Prince Eugene's efforts to win them over to his cause. Eventually, Eugene, being unable to take the post, was compelled to withdraw from the city. The grenadiers of Austria are proper men and tall. The grenadiers of Austria have scaled the city wall. They have marched from far away, ere the dawning of the day, and the morning saw the masters of Cremona. There's not a man to whisper, there's not a horse to neigh, of the footmen of Lorraine and the riders of Dupre. They have crept up every street, in the marked place they meet. They are holding every vantage in Cremona. The Marshal Villeroy, he has started from his bed. The Marshal Villeroy has no wig upon his head. I have lost my men, quoth he, and my men they have lost me, and I sorely fear we both have lost Cremona. Prince Eugene of Austria is in the marketplace. Prince Eugene of Austria has smiles upon his face. Says he, our work is done, for the citadel is won, and the black and yellow flag flies o'er Cremona. Major Dan O'Mahony is in the barrack square, and just six hundred Irish lads are waiting for him there. Says he, come in your shirt and you won't take any hurt, for the morning air is pleasant in Cremona. Major Dan O'Mahony is at the barrack gate, and just six hundred Irish lads will neither stay nor wait. There's Dillon, and there's Burke, and there'll be some bloody work, ere the Kaiserlich shall boast they hold Cremona. Major Dan O'Mahony has reached the river fort, and just six hundred Irish lads are joining in the sport. Come take a hand, says he, and if you will stand by me, then is glory to the man who takes Cremona. 
Prince Eugene of Austria, has frowns upon his face, and loud he calls his galloper of Irish blood and race. Macdonnell, ride, I pray, to your countrymen, and say, that only they are left in all Cremona. Macdonnell, he has reined his mare beside the river dyke, and he has tied the parley flag upon a sergeant's pike. Six companies were there, from Limerick and Clare, the last of all the guardians of Cremona. Now, Major Dan O'Mahony, give up the river gate, or Major Dan O'Mahony, you'll find it is too late. For when I gallop back, tis the signal for attack, and no quarter for the Irish in Cremona. And Major Dan, he laughed. Faith, if what you say be true, and if they will not come until they hear again from you, then there will be no attack, for you're never going back, and we'll keep you snug and safely in Cremona. All the weary day the German stormers came, all the weary day they were faced by fire and flame. They have filled the ditch with dead, and the rivers running red, but they cannot win the gateway of Cremona. All the weary day, again, 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 the horsemen of Dupre and the footmen of Lorraine, Taff and Herberstein, and the riders of the Rhine, it's a mighty price they're paying for Cremona. Time and time they came with deep-mouthed German roar, Time and time they broke like the wave upon the shore, For better men were there from Limerick and Clare, And who will take the gateway of Cremona? Prince Eugene has watched, and he gnaws his nether lip, Prince Eugene has cursed as he saw his chances slip. Call off, call off, he cried. It is nearing even tide, and I fear our work is finished in Cremona. Says Wocho to Mac Olive, their fire is growing slack. Says Major Dan and Mahoney, it is their last attack. But who will stop the game while there's light to play the same? and to walk a short way with them from Cremona. And so they snarl behind him, and beg them turn and come. They have taken Neuburg standard, they have taken DX drum. And along the winding Po, beard on shoulder, stern and slow, the Kaiserlicks are riding from Cremona. Just two hundred Irish lads are shouting on the wall. Four hundred more are lying, who can hear no slogan call. But what's the odds of that? For it's all the same to Pat, if he pays his debt in Dublin or Cremona. Says General de Vaudray, you've done a soldier's work, and every tongue in France shall hear of Dillon and of Burke. Ask what you will this day, and be it what it may, it is granted to the heroes of Cremona. Why then, says Dan O'Mahony, one favour we entreat. We were cold a little early, and our toilet's not complete. We've no quarrel with the shirt, but the breeches wouldn't hurt, for the evening air is chilly in Cremona. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Irish Colonel by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by phone Said the King to the Colonel The complaints are eternal That you Irish give more trouble Than any other corps Said the Colonel to the King This complaint is no new thing For your foemen, sire, have made it A hundred times before End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Oh, the sight and trancing by Thomas Moore from the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1, read for LibriVox.org by phone. Oh, the sight and trancing when morning's beam is glancing 
O'er files arrayed with helm and blade, And plumes in the gay wind dancing. When hearts are all high beating, And the trumpet's voice repeating That song whose breath may lead to death, But never to retreating. Then, if a cloud comes over The brow of sire or lover, Think tis the shade by victory made, Whose wings right o'er us hover. Oh, the sight entrancing, when the morning beam is glancing, our files arrayed with helm and blade, and plumes in the gay wind dancing. Yet tis not helm nor feather, for ask yon despot whether his plumed bands could bring such hands and hearts as ours together. Leave pomps to those who need em, give man but heart and freedom. And proud he braves the gaudiest slaves That crawl where monarchs lead him. The sword may pierce the beaver, Stone walls in time may sever, Tis mind alone, worth steel and stone, That keeps men free for ever. Oh, that sight entrancing, When the morning's beam is glancing, O'er files arrayed with helm and blade, and in freedom's cause advancing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Burial of Sir John Moore by Charles Wolfe From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by phone Not a drum was heard, not a funeral note, as his course to the rampart we hurried. Not a soldier discharged his farewell shot, or the grave where our hero we buried. We buried him darkly at dead of night, the sods with their bayonets turning, by the struggling moonbeam's misty light, and the lantern dimly burning. No useless coffin enclosed his breast, not in sheet or in shroud we wound him, But he lay like a warrior taking his rest With his martial cloak around him. Few and short were the prayers we said, And we spoke not a word of sorrow, But we steadfastly gazed on the face that was dead, And we bitterly thought of the morrow. We thought as we hollowed his narrow bed, and smoothed down his lonely pillow, that the foe and the stranger would tread o'er his head, and we far away on the billow. Lightly they'll talk of the spirit that's gone, and o'er his cold ashes upbraid him, but little he'll wreck if they let him sleep on in the grave where a Briton has laid him. But half of our heavy task was done, when the clock struck the hour for retiring, and we heard the distant and random gun that the foe was suddenly firing. Slowly and sadly we laid him down from the field of his fame fresh and gory. We carved not a line, and we raised not a stone, but we left him alone in his glory. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ways of War by Lionel Johnson From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by phone A terrible and splendid trust Heartens the host of Innisfail Their dream is of the swift sword thrust A lightning glory of the gale Croke Patrick is the place of prayers And Tara the assembling place but each sweet wind of Ireland bears the trump of battle on its race. From Dursey Isle to Donegal, from House to Achill, the glad noise rings, and the airs of glory fall, or victory crowns their fighting joys. A dream, a dream, an ancient dream, yet ere peace come to Innisfail, some weapons on some field must gleam, 
Some burning glory fire the gale. That field may lie beneath the sun, Fair for the treading of a host. That field in the realms of thought be won, And armed minds do their uttermost. Some way to faithful in his fail Shall come the majesty and all Of martial truth that must prevail To lay on all the eternal law. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sword by Michael Joseph Berry From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by phone What writes the brave? The sword. What frees the slave? The sword. What cleaves in twain the despot's chain And makes his gyves and dungeon vain? The sword. Then cease thy proud task never, While rests a link to sever. Guard of the free will cherish thee, And keep thee bright for ever. What checks the knave? The sword. What smites to save? The sword. What wreaks the wrong, unpunished long, At last upon the guilty strong? The sword. Then cease thy proud task, never, While rests a link to sever. Guard of the free will cherish thee, And keep thee bright forever. What shelters right? The sword. What makes it might? The sword. What strikes the crown of tyrants down, And answers with its flash their frown? The sword. Then cease thy proud task never, While rests a link to sever. Guard of the free will cherish thee, And keep thee bright forever. Still be thou true, good sword, Will die or do, good sword. Leap forth to light if tyrants smite, And trust our arms to wield thee right, good sword. Yes, seize thy proud task never, While rests a link to sever. Guard of the free will cherish thee, And keep thee bright for ever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Soldier's Wake by Timothy Daniel Sullivan From the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1 Read for LibriVox.org by phone And this is all she has to lay Tonight upon the snowy sheets Before the friends who come the way And sighing take their humble seats This medal, bravely, dearly won Poor token of her gallant son but over this as naught beside Of him she loved to her remains. The lights are lit, the keen is cried, And women croon their saddest strains, While men who knew his boyhood well Say foes went down before he fell. These clasps and medal, only these, For this she nursed and loved him long. She rocked him softly on her knees, And filled his earth with pleasant song, And saw him with a mother's pride Grow up and strengthen by her side. Till, bright with manhood's glowing charms, He, in his turn, her nurse became. He clasped her in his manly arms, And fondly propped her drooping frame. Her step grew weak, her eye grew dim, but then she lived and moved in him. He went, he joined the deadly fight, His true heart loved her not the less, But these are all she has tonight, To light and cheer her loneliness. These silver honours dearly won, Poor tokens of her gallant son. But even these, to-morrow morn, When lights burn out and friends depart, Shall round her withered neck be worn, 
shall lie upon her weary heart till death for his dear memory's sake and then shall deck another wake end of poem this recording is in the public domain a song of defeat by stephen gwynne from the book of irish poetry part 1 read for LibriVox.org by phone not for the lucky warriors the winner at waterloo or him of a newer name whom loud voiced triumphs acclaim victor against a few not for these o oh heir i build in my heart to-day the lay of your sons and you i call to your mind to-day out of the mists of the past many a hull and many a mast black in the bight of the bay over against ben Edare, and the lip of the ebbing tideway all red with the life of the gale and gall and the danes in a headlong slaughter sent and the women of air keening for brian slain at his tent mother o oh grey sad mother love with the troubled eyes for whom i marshal to-day the sad and splendid array calling the lost to arise as some queen's courtier unbidden might fetch her gems to the sun praising the glory and glow of all that was hers to show ere love brian well for brian fought and he fell but brian fought and he won god that was long ago nearer and dearer to you ere ere maubron listen to a name of your own a sweet name my sorrow are the suns that flamed and faded in a night that had no morrow i call to your mind red hue and the castle's broken ward i call to your mind o'neill and the fight at the yellow ford and the ships afloat on the main bearing o'donnell to spain for the flame of his quick and leaping soul to be quenched in a venomed bowl and the shore by the swilly's shadows and the earls pushed out through the foam and o'neill in his grave clothes lying with the wish of his heart in ireland and his body cold in rome i call to your mind ben burr and the stubborn ulster steel and the triumph of owen roe clonmo and the glorious stand of the younger hugh o'neill and owen dead at derry and cromwell loosed on the land i call to your mind brave sarsfield and the battle in limerick street the mine and the shattered wall and the battered breach held good and william full in retreat and at the end of all wild geese rising on clamorous wing to follow the flight of an alien king and the hard-won treaty broke and the elder faith oppressed and the blood but not for ireland red upon sarsfield's breast ended the roll of the great and famous leaders of armies the shining lamps of the gale who wrestled awhile with fate and broke the battle of foemen ere the end left widowed air lone with her desolate wail lone yet forsaken out of no far dim past Call I the names of the lost who strove and suffered for air. Saddest and nearest of all, see how they flock to the call, the troop of famous felons who won no joy of the sword, who tasted of no reward, but the faint flushed dawn of a wan sick hope, and over whose lives there dangled ever the shame of the rope. I call to your mind, Lord Edward, tone with his mangled throat, Emmet high on the gallows, O'Brien, Mitchell, and meagre, ay, and of newer note, names that e'er will not forget, though some have faded in far-off lands, 
and some have passed by the hangman's hands, and some are breathing yet. Not for these, O oh air, not for these or thee, pipers, trumpeters, blaring loud, the throbbing drums and the colours flying, and the long-drawn muffled roar of the crowd, the voice of a human sea. Theirs it is to inherit, fame of a finer grace, in the self-renewing spirit, and the untamable heart, ever defeated, yet undefeated, of thy remembering race. For their names are treasured apart, and their memories green and sweet, on every hillside and every mart, in every cabin, in every street, of a land where to fail is more than to triumph, and victory less than defeat. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of the Book of Irish Poetry, Part 1. Edited and translated by Alfred Percival Graves.